Okay, we are recording. I am sharing my screen and starting the PowerPoint. Welcome to the July 2022 Zoom meeting of the Central Florida Astronomical Society. So yes, we are back to Zoom uh, for various reasons. Uh, our agenda for tonight, uh, we're going to talk about our new meeting format and why we're back on Zoom. Uh, a few other announcements and things. And then uh, Dr. Dan Britt will be joining us from UCF to talk about economics and exploration. Apparently, it's not free to send robots uh, out into the solar system. Uh, we'll have our member astrophoto showcase curated by uh, Derek Demeter. Mauricio Moreno, a uh, CFIS member who uh, recently moved to South Florida, will be joining us virtually to talk about stars over West Palm Beach. And um, I'm going to go over this, the photos from the James Webb Space Telescope in case your social media you know, feeds weren't flooded enough with them. Um, and then uh, I had the privilege of uh, spending a week at the Grand Canyon Star Party a couple of weeks. So you're going to have to look at my vacation photos uh, from a really awesome uh, star party. So um, new meeting plan. So the board uh, has, has been talking about this. I did send out an email on Groups.io. Uh, hopefully you saw, you know, a more longer wind uh, rationalization of what we're going to do. But, you know, the post-pandemic world, uh, speakers prefer doing Zoom. I think a lot of members still are more comfortable uh, doing Zoom. And so meeting once a month, uh, we, we're just not getting the same traction that we were before the pandemic. So we're going to do seven monthly meetings, just like this one via Zoom, like we did during the pandemic. Um, we had good attendance uh, through most of the pandemic uh, via Zoom as well. We're still going to skip one month in August for summer break. Uh, the summer tends to be very slow outreach wise and, and attendance wise. People are uh, tend to be very busy, uh, but really exciting. At least four months uh, left over. We're going to do four monthly meetings. They're going to be Saturday star parties. So we'll be meeting on campus. It'll be an expanded format uh, from what used to be our regular monthly meeting. Uh, we'll have a main program and speaker and possibly some, uh, some breakout workshops afterwards. And we'll have hands-on with telescopes and set up in the parking lot uh, to do you know, what we can do. We have a lot of new members. CFIS uh, has really, really grown over the course of the pandemic. And most of our new members are like most people who've been getting into astronomy lately. Um, in fact, talking to most of my astronomy friends in the vendor community, um, business is better than it's ever been. Um, lots of people are getting into the hobby of astronomy or are thinking, hey, what can I do by myself in my backyard? Whatever the reasons, uh, we have a lot of new uh, amateur astronomers in the world and uh, we have a flood of them in the, in the, in the, in the club right now. So some hands-on meetings where people can bring their telescopes and set them up and get help. Um, I remember a long, long time ago um, having a telescope. I bought the biggest, most expensive telescope I could afford and could not even collimate it. And it was at a CFIS meeting. Somebody helped me collimate my scope for the first time. Um, and it really made a big difference. And well, look at me today. So uh, I think this would be great for, uh, for our new members and uh, people who are just getting started in amateur astronomy. We certainly don't want them getting frustrated and burned out. And, um, and wandering away. So board news, uh, big welcome to Elizabeth Vega, who's uh, joining as our education chair. Uh, her email is education at uh, She was just elected to the board at the last board meeting, and she's going to be, we're going to put her to work for sure, uh, especially on our quarterly meetings where we're going to plan some workshops and some hands-on activities for everyone. Um, other board news, our outreach chair is open uh, once again. Um, we had a, a very long run with a very active uh, uh, you know, uh, outreach chair. Um, then we changed to um, Lynn needed to step down and uh, Mauricio took over and then uh, we had another guy. So we still need an outreach chair. This is not someone who has to be at all of the outreach events, uh, but we need someone to coordinate requests for outreach and with our volunteers. Uh, that help. Uh, right now during the summer, it's very slow. We don't get a lot of outreach requests in the summer. Uh, and if you don't know what outreach is, it's basically volunteers show up, set up telescopes, and the public looks through the telescopes and you talk about what they're looking at. Uh, and if you've ever set up in your front yard, 
I like to set up every Halloween, for example. Um, it's, it's great fun and it's a great excuse to get out and meet people and that sort of thing. But we need somebody to coordinate when those requests come into CFIS. Most of the time it's school events or Cub Scout events or, or whatnot. And in the fall, it will definitely pick up. Uh, and we have quite a few um, volunteers, of course, who are, who are very uh, active in, in that. If you are interested, uh, email me at president.cfis.org. I can think of at least five or six members who are very active in the outreach community who I would love to hear from uh, if that were to come along. And that's it. That's all I'm going to blather about. Uh, it's showtime. We're going to let uh, our main speaker, uh, I'm going to let Tricia introduce him. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, I'm probably going to turn my video off and I'm going to listen for a while, which is. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yep. Yes. Okay. You, you're coming across. Uh, well, thank you so much. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you so much, Dr. Brick, for coming to speak with us today. We really appreciate it. And so to let you guys know a little bit about Dr. Dan Britt, he is the Pegasus Professor of Astronomy and Planetary Sciences at the Department of Physics at the University of Central Florida. He was educated at the University of Washington and Brown University, receiving a PhD from Brown in 91. He has served on the science teams of four NASA missions, Mars Pathfinder and Deep Space One, New, the New Horizons, Horizons mission science team, and the flyby for a Kuiper Belt asteroid, and also the Lucy mission science team for a series of flybys of asteroids near Jupiter. He has a very eclectic background, and I'm going to put a link for you guys to go read some more about Dr. Dan Britt, but after a lot of talking, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Britt. So thank you very much for coming to speak with us tonight, Dr. Dan Britt. Well, thanks for inviting me, and uh, uh, what you're going to get tonight is something entirely different. Uh, uh, in my sorted past, I had a career in economics and have a master's degree in economics. Too. And that one of the first in space reasons is they lack almost entirely any historical perspective on previous epochs of exploration and some of the historical lessons that you can learn from those. And so what I'm going to talk about right now is a bit of economics, a bit of history, and apply it to where we are today in space exploration and the dawn of really commercial space and space as an economic phenomenon. So um, what I would encourage is people to ask questions. Uh, you know, put them in the chat, and if I notice them, I will, I will try to address questions, and I will certainly take questions when I'm done, or if I say something way too outrageous, you can, uh, you can raise your hand, and, uh, and, uh, and I'll try to address that. But what we're going to talk about is his historical perspective, and basically, we're going to be looking forward by looking back. We're at the start of the, really the dawn of a new age of exploration. And there's some useful lessons to be learned from previous eras of exploration. And so I'm going to go back to really the dawn of Western uh, exploration with Columbus. And the details of this are fairly interesting. Now, one of the things that always bothered me was you learn dates in school. And so Columbus sails the ocean blue and discovers the Western Hemisphere in 1492. But it wasn't until 115 years later that the first settlement occurred in North America with Jamestown in 1607. Why did it take so long? 
And that actually has implications for why it's taken so long to get off our our duff and do more moon exploration since the the first moon exploration was 50 years ago. What? Why does it take so long to to get back to the moon and make it an economic phenomenon? So, Jamestown in 1607, Massachusetts settlement in 1620. Why so long between Columbus and the North American settlement? And the issue is not is really economics. So what I'm going to do is apply a few economic principles, and I learned them from this guy, Doug North who um, won the Nobel Prize in economics for looking at economic history using an economic perspective. And what you need to do in looking at historical events is apply an economic-based structure. Things occur, investments occur, expeditions occur based on some, ba some basic principles. And those tend to be a risk-return matrix. Investors assess the expected returns and discount those returns by associated risk. You have investment and entry costs. Are there barriers to entry or high initial investments? And the barriers can be legal, physical, social, technological, whole range of things. And we're seeing those all the time in space technology. Um, opportunity costs. What is the cost of the next best alternative to your investment? Because that's what you're foregoing in order to make the investment in, say, Columbus's ships. If that cost is high, you might not make that investment. And finally, externalities. These are unintended costs of your actions. And you have externalities all the time. Going to CFAST today, and listening to me, there's an external cost that you can't go and watch Netflix or your spouse is annoyed that you're gone. But you're willing to bear these external costs, these externalities, in order to be entertained by me or maybe not. Anyway, but it, any investment has unintended consequences, unintended costs, and it's not necessarily the people in that exchange or in that investment that actually bear those costs. And that's something to remember for any sort of exploration. So let's start with Columbus. You look at the risk return, the original investment was a grant coming off a research proposal. It was a terrible proposal. The proposal was highly speculative. It reviewed very poorly. It had been turned down multiple times before. In fact, Columbus had gotten thrown out of Portugal because it was such a bad proposal. Even I have ne never gotten thrown out of a country for a proposal. Um, but it had the potential for a very high return. And so it eventually got funded. Look at the investment entry costs. Um, it turned out that, um, that the funding agency appears to have substantially cut the grant relative to the proposed costs. Um, the ships that were used were small and old. They weren't, uh, they weren't adequately uh, staffed with uh, personnel. Uh, the crown, the Spanish crown actually dumped a lot of the costs, supply costs and shipping costs onto the, onto coastal cities. For opportunity costs, you, they had just finished off the Moorish war, had kept, uh, had kicked the, um, the, the Muslims out of Spain. And so unemployment was high and there was a funding piece dividend. So that cut down the cost of crewing and ship rental because there were a lot of unemployed resources. But of course you didn't really know what the external costs are because um, there are a lot of unknowns. I actually, I, um, I read about, uh, I read Columbus's the details of Columbus's proposal. And since I've been on NASA review panels, I put together this. You know, if Columbus had been reviewed by a NASA review panel, it, his review would, be, would look something like this. And I will call your attention to um, 
to uh, the overall summary, which is, while the goal is very attractive, the proposal has a number of major weaknesses. The proposer asserts that the Earth's circumference is substantially smaller than observational data has shown over the past 1900 years. This seems to be based on simple errors in units. The realistic distances to be sailed put the proposed goals far beyond the effective range of shipping technology, which is true. The principal investigator does not de demonstrate the relevant navigation, scientific, and mission leadership experiences required for success of this proposal, which you actually read things a lot like this in, in NASA reviews, and I've written a few of them. So anyway, I, I detail out the, the major weaknesses. He had a lot, but he got funded. What happened was that he got funded at a fairly low level. So what's impressive is the small size of the ships that crossed the Atlantic. To my mind, this is clear signs of, of budget cuts and a, a clear signs that the attitude of funding agencies has not changed much in the last 500 years, that they have a tendency to, to lowball you. But he went and he found a new world. He never actually figured out that he wasn't in China because of course that was the goal of the, 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 obje the objective was to open up new trade routes to China. One of the problems of any expedition is going to be basic support, food, ship repair, crew replacement. This is what we talk about at NASA in terms of the gear ratio concept how much material you have, to, you have to drag with you in order to, to deliver a payload. And the problem that Columbus and the early explorers found very quickly was you simply could not carry enough food and supplies from Europe to support extended stays and exploration in new territories. And so what they did very early on was they set up advanced bases to, to support their exploration initiatives. And that's literally what Columbus did almost immediately. He left behind 40 odd crew members with orders to grow food for the next, to supply the next trip because his, his loiter time in the Caribbean was very short because he had used up his available food supply. And what happened was that the Spanish developed Havana as the central supply and refit hub for the Spanish Caribbean. Manila was developed to serve that role in the Far East. Um, and it's the same story with all the other English possessions uh, or the other European exploring countries. Um, New England for the English, Goa in India for the Portuguese, uh, Cape Town and Java for the Dutch. All of them built advanced bases in order to handle this gear ratio problem. And that's something we're talking about right now with sustainable lunar exploration. Exploit local resources, use those to reduce risk, reduce costs, extend your, your reach and exploration. Um, and it's interesting that almost all the significant discoveries were not made by expeditions being based out of Spain and going to the New World, but expeditions that started in the New World. So Cortez, for instance, started out of Cuba. And the first that the Spanish crown learned about the discovery of Mexico and the subsequent conquest of Mexico was after it happened, because that was done out of the advanced base at local initiative. The same thing with the conquest of the, the, uh, the Incas, or the Pizarro. Again, a local expedition from an advanced base. Um, and what you got was this huge return from a trivial, environment, trivial investment. Um, the Spanish encountered highly organized, very wealthy civilization, which they overthrew and looted. 
And silver from the Americas accounted for roughly one fifth of the Spanish Empire's budget for the next 200 years. Uh, historians can debate about uh, the effects of this, but it it allowed them to run a expansive foreign policy in Europe. And what happened was that the gold and silver from the Americas roughly tripled the stock of precious metals, world stock of precious metals. And from an economic point of view, what this will do is set off a frenzy of investment and settlement. Something like 5% of Spain's population immigrated to America during the 16th century. And it also encouraged competition for these treasures. Um, Francis Drake from England circumnavigated the, goal, the, the globe back in 1577. Uh, the reason he was doing that was he was a pirate. The voyage was essentially to capture Spanish treasure ships. And he did this in the, uh, in, uh, uh, in the Pacific, largest capture to that date, he got six tons of gold and silver. Um, the returns for Queen Elizabeth at the time, because she was an investor, paid off the entire crown foreign debt of England. And this is a problem that we're gonna have, is the age of exploration was actually also the age of piracy. And you know, a moment's reflection will tell you that, well, of course, you have lots of high value cargoes going through sparsely populated areas with no effective rule of law. So of course there's going to be piracy. What's happened is that the shipping technology outran the reach of institutional control. And with the revolution in launch costs and new launchers and new entry, into the field of space exploration. That's happening again. We are on the cusp of out, outrunning our technology, outrunning the reach of our institutional control. Now, you talk about Francis Drake. I was quite surprised when I was teaching one of my classes when I was uh, that uh, people that were brought up in the Hispanic her heritage. Uh, found out that Drake is not a, not a great explorer and hero. He's the worst sort of pirate, thug, and bandit. And this is fundamentally a jurisdictional problem. One person's pirate is another person's great explorer. And we're likely to run into that again when we're doing exploration and doing resource exploitation on asteroids and the moon. Because who owns these resources? Well, good question. How do you establish that? Another good question. In, in the great age of exploration, it was basically a free-for-all. And a lot of the uh, institutional framework that we've developed since then has been to deal with the problem that, um, of legality. And aside to this, of course, is that there's this uh, thing that economists call the resource curse. It turns out that natural resource rich countries tend to have less economic growth and worse development outcomes than others. And we can probably name a few recent examples. Um, the problem is that a huge influx of resource wealth does a bunch of economic damage. Um, the cash allows for more imports, damaging local industries and causing unemployment. The increased government revenue increases opportunities for graft and corruption. Um, large resources encourage political and military overreach. And there's a strong incentive for labor and resources to go to the natural resource sector at the expense of other sectors of the economy. And this was really devastating. For Spain, the result was high unemployment, 
depopulation, erosion of the skill base, corruption, centralization. And in a real sense, Spain has only in the last century gotten over the problems caused by this resource curse from the from the uh, the wealth of the Americans. Um, what they used to essentially project their power across oceans was the shipping technology of the time, the galleon. Uh, it, for the time, it was pretty good, um, pretty good technology. Stable, re, a strongly built, reduced uh, wind resistance, fast and maneuverable, capable of long voyages. Um, they, um, in the 1500s, they started annual trading voyages from Mexico to Manila, 14,000 kilometers one way. Um, they were huge. But they were designed for a high threat environment. They were designed for the Mediterranean, which was full of pirates. They were heavily armed. They had a very high freeboard so that you, it's hard to get into the ship. And this was useful for the Spaniards since their cargoes tend to be small but high valued. But they were very expensive. You had to have space for large crews. You had to carry a lot of guns uh, because you, uh, did long voyages, you had to allow for your crew dying of disease and scurvy. So wastage, expensive to build, expensive to maintain, expensive to crew, but the returns of the Americas made it worthwhile. But what you were shipping were people one direction, gold and silver the other. Um, And of course, you're running into unknown unknowns. Now, Columbus's first voyage, first voyage started in August 1492, and he came back in March 1493. We all know that that's what's called hurricane season in the uh, Caribbean. Columbus didn't know about hurricanes. Um, but during the age of sail, encounter with a hurricane means you die. And fleets of the day, once they learned about hurricanes, tried to get out of the tropics before about this time of year. Um, the map here shows the wreck of the 1733 Spanish treasure fleet because they farted around uh, uh, the Caribbean and essentially delayed uh, until late August. They're sailing out of Havana. Columbus brushed one hurricane and he was essentially very lucky. But this is what happens with hurricanes. This is a, a Hurricane Sandy, um, the historic HMS Bounty got caught in the, the eye of Hurricane Sandy. This is what happens to sailing ships and hurricanes. Bad news, unknown, unknown. Gotta watch out for it. One of the big externalities in exploration is that you don't know what you're going to find. And what happened is that they, the Spanish basically discovered a, a vast continent thickly populated with natives. And a big question to science has been, what was the population of America before Columbus? And you go and read the uh, accounts of the early explorers, and you find that actually there are a lot of people. Uh, De Soto's accounts describe the Mississippi Valley as a land thickly set with great towns. Two or three of these great towns can be seen from each one. Each city protected itself with earthen walls, moats, and archers. 150 years later, La Salle visited the same area. Didn't see a single native. For 200 miles. Something big happened at that time. We can actually see the marks from this large population. Um, mound cities are all over the central U.S. and the south. I visited a few. Much of North America, North and South America was farmed and managed. Um, 
there's extensive use of fire to clear land. Um, the early explorers quite often talked about open park-like forests in the American East and the constant fires that the natives set during the summer to open up the forest. The reason they did this was they, they managed the forest and managed the species. So a big chunk of their food came from nut production. So they encouraged chestnuts and hickories and oaks. And they tried to keep the forest park-like for the elk and deer herds. Um, visitors to New England in the 1500s reported large villages with extensive fields of corn occupying every inlet. Um, there was one of the big reasons for no settlement before the Mayflower um, was that the coast was too crowded with natives. Um, explorers in Virginia remarked on the smoky nature of the land and the numerous fires set to clear the land. In fact, the Mayflower settlers survived the first several winters by essentially scavenging food supplies from deserted villages, deserted Amer Native American villages, because they had a vast epidemic uh, just before the Mayflower arrived that killed 90% of New England's Native population. And so basically the first uh, 50 or so Puritan settlements were essentially built on deserted Indian villages. A lot of evidence is pointing that the population of the Americas is probably around 100 to 120 million, which was 20% of the world's population at the time. By 1600, it had collapsed to 5 million. The population of central Mexico collapsed down to about 800,000 from 20 to 30 million by 1600. In fact, the population of Mexico took until the 20th century for the population of Mexico to recover. What had happened was that um, Europeans had long been living with domesticated livestock, but livestock is not just a food source. It's also a disease vector, and we share diseases with our livestock through mutation. So avian flu becomes human flu. Bovine rinder pest becomes measles. Horsepox becomes smallpox. Pigs transmit anthrax, brucellosis, lepidosis, trichinosis, flu, and tuberculosis. DeSoto, when he wandered all through the South, one of his major sources of food was he took herds of pigs with him. Lots of those pigs went wild. They became endemic in the South. And, and the Native Americans did not know what to do about wild pigs. Uh, and also these wild pigs carry diseases. Um, and Europe and Africa are not just full of diseases. Uh, we're not just full of these livestock diseases, but also diseases that could thrive in American climates that had just not been transported here. So there was no malaria, no yellow fever prior to Columbus. All of this arrived in a tidal wave called the Columbia Exchange. And the Native Americans got um, coffee beans and olives but they also got smallpox, typhus, influenza, measles, malaria, bacteria, we'll keep off, plague. We got tomatoes, pumpkins, um, peanuts, squash. Lots of exchange. Um, point is that we basically removed about a fifth of the world's population. You can actually see that in the drop in the CO2 levels trapped in, in uh, ice cores. Um, and really, that's one of the things that probably helped bring in what's called the Little Ice Age, was this drop in atmospheric CO2 caused by the regrowth of forests that were no longer being managed by fire. Anyway, um, 
I wouldn't blame our, I don't want to spend much time blaming uh, Western civilization because of course the spread of infectious disease is kind of inevitable. It could have been the Aztecs who developed ocean going three masted vessels, steel, firearms, military organization, and just jumped on the Gulf Stream, caught the prevailing westerlies and discovered France. But what would happen? Again, they've been an isolated population. They would have no immunities. Um, and the result would be the same. They would carry the disease back home, start multiple epidemics, population collapse. So um, that's a rather large externality for exploration. Now, you're not going to go around destroying settled civilizations on other planets or on asteroids. But this is a sort of unknown unknown that happens. A, this is a big example, and it's useful to keep in mind. So what was happening in North America during the 1500s? It was not like we were ignoring North America. Um, a guy who was called John Cabot was hired by English merchants to explore North America, and he actually made two voyages not long after Columbus in the, four, in the late 1400s. Um, this whole John Cabot thing is actually a, a myth. The guy's name was Giovanni Cabato. He was an Italian navigator. But he just didn't find much except lumber and fishing grounds and lots of natives thickly inhabiting the, the shore. Jacques Carter, uh, Cartier, uh, did three voyages uh, to North America. He found uh, stuff that he thought was diamonds and gold that turned out to be pyrite and quartz. Uh, Verrazano did three voyages, um, did things like gave, gave his name to the Verrazano Narrows in New York. Um, but they really didn't find uh, easy entry into, um, into uh, big resources. The natural resources that were around were fishing on the Great Grand Banks and lumbering on offshore islands, primarily because these early explorers had a tendency to kidnap the natives, to bring them back to show off in Europe. And after that happened a bit, the natives wised up and didn't exactly welcome people with open arms. So they used up their uh, any chance of uh, of making uh, agreements with the locals. So what was happening in North America in the 1500s from our economic point of view? Well, problem is that the shores of North America were thickly settled by sophisticated well-armed natives. Getting a foothold is very tough. Uh, the Spanish claimed everything and they discouraged, actively discouraged other explorers. One of the things that people don't realize is that this freedom of the, of the seas thing that we take for normal is really something that the English and Dutch invented as a response to Spanish and Portuguese interference because the Spanish and Portuguese claimed all the world. And the Spanish claimed all of North America and the Caribbean and would, would shoot people on sight, hang them as pirates. And also wages and shipping costs went back up. The costs of voyages were high enough to, to discourage a lot of things. And what would have to happen is that the economic and risk factors needed to change in order to allow for expanded exploration. And what happened during the 1500s was exactly that. Shipping technology changed. In Northern Europe, you developed a thing called the Dutch flute, which was really designed for a more benign threat environment than the galleon. North Sea didn't have the kind of piracy problem that the Mediterranean did. It was cheaper to build, carried twice the cargo per ton as the galleon, could be handled by a much smaller crew. 
They used block and tackle technology, which was you know, new technology in the 1500s, so that relatively few uh, deckhands could actually raise and trim the sails. You didn't need quite as many, uh, you didn't need anywhere near as large of a crew. And so it also minimized armaments to maximize cargo space. And these factors combined for sharply lower transportation costs. Running a Dutch flute per ton was something like three times cheaper than running a galleon. And that factor was enough to change the equation. So by the time settled Jamestown, the risk return matrix had changed. Um, the natives were dying off because of endemic disease. Uh, the Spanish had gotten themselves deep into other problems and di didn't really have the time or the resources to go around and, and uh, uh, harass English settlements. And you started to get some useful returns because shipping costs are down. So that you can actually uh, make money by returning with cargoes of, uh, of bulk products like rice, lumber, tobacco. Um, but by 1627, so that's like 20 years after the founding of Jamestown, they were exporting half a million pounds a year of tobacco. Investment entry costs had changed. So the transportation costs had dropped by a factor of three due to the Dutch flute. And land was increasingly expensive in Europe and very cheap in America. Uh, for opportunity costs, real wages had been falling since the recovery of the population from the Black Death. And effective wages for laborers in, laborers in Virginia were more than double that in England. So you built up a system where your major European export was people and you were you were uh, returning with cargoes of bulk products like rice and lumber. Um, same thing with Plymouth. Revolution in transportation costs meant that you could make money hauling people to North America, returning with bulk cargoes. Uh, it was very attractive for um, some immigrant groups, especially re religious fringe groups like the Puritans. Land was cheap, Spanish were less of a threat, the natives were mostly dead. Um, and so, same story. Wages and transportation costs were low, so Europe exported people, returned with, with bulk products. What happened here is you're developing an integrated Atlantic economy based on the production of bulk agricultural staples. So you're not creating an economy based on exploiting um, settled civilizations or, or uh, precious metals. You're actually producing things that were, um, were uh, uh, you could develop an economy on. So sugar from the West Indies, lumber and fish from New England, tobacco, rice, cotton from Virginia and the Carolinas. Low transportation costs, cheap land, few, few barriers to entry or investment. And also you had a fairly good legal protection system in English common law in North America. And I suggest a number of really good books for this. 1491 is about the uh, Western hemisphere before Columbus. And 1493 was really about the world that Columbus, the discovery of the new world uh, made. And uh, one of the things I really like is this Rise of the Western World by Doug Norris, if you want to read economic history. Um, when I first gave this talk, uh, I had a question about, well, what about, you know, uh, you know obviously, the Western Europeans were not very nice. Maybe 
somebody else did a better job of exploration and explored with less disruption or externalities. And so I actually went and looked at, um, at other societies, the Chinese, Polynesians, and even the human migrations in the new territories. And basically it's the same story. Um, you hear a lot about the Ming treasure voyages back in the 1400s, but this wasn't really exploration. Um, these trading routes have been known for centuries. This was really Chinese political power being um, being projected in, into into new areas in order for them to uh, dabble in local politics. So risk return, not really exploration. This is power projection in a military expedition. Um, investment entry. This is very expensive, but China was a very rich. Uh, society, but this was sort of analogous to the, a carrier battle group, and carrier battle groups do encourage trade by increasing security. Um, for opportunity costs, transport costs were relatively low. Chinese maritime technology was well developed. Uh, the Chinese wages were high, but this was a military expedition. Um, for externalities, it did improve security for Chinese trade, but it was expensive and politically risky. And what happened was that it became a pawn of palace intrigues in kind of a war between the civil bureaucracy and the palace eunuchs. And the odd thing to remember is that the guy who ran these um, expeditions was one of the eunuchs. The eunuchs were the explorers. And eventually they lost out in the, uh, the uh, political battle. Uh, the Polynesian navigators, I mean, this is one of the great triumphs of human ingenuity starting about three, uh, about 5,000 years ago and climaxing with the settlement of Hawaii. Uh, Micronesians and Polynesians spread out from Taiwan to settle the islands in the Central and South Pacific. And this is great. They developed long distance deep water navigation, stable, durable technology for, for sailing and the ability to transfer a working ecology to a new settlement. So it was, it, it's quite impressive. But you look at this in terms of our model, risk return. If you live on a small island, nothing brings resource and land limitations into sharper focus than living on a small island because population rapidly increases to fill every niche. And what happens is that you tend to have local competition. These societies tend to be not just a bit violent, very violent. Um, the piece of Proof I would have is the number of Samoans that are in the National Football League. Is it an accident that Samoans tend to be very big and very agile? I think not. I think that what happens is being in a small society where you have constant warfare, where your warfare is with, with clubs and sticks, it helps to be big and fast. So investment entry, new land, if you can find it, is very attractive. And they move their, their ecology with them. Um, turns out you can fit the necessary food bearing plants, animals, you know, dogs, pigs, breakfast, poi, on these modest sized ships. Opportunity costs and transport costs are low. Major Polynesian surplus was people, but you have substantial externalities because basically, when you transport your ecology to this new area, what you do is you're going to destroy the old ecology. Um, and basically major extinctions were common wherever the Polynesians showed up. Um, new Zealand had 10 species of flightless birds that were bigger than 500 pounds. I would not really want to share an island with a 500 pound flightless bird myself. I can see what their point of view, but this is what happens. 
Um, crocodiles in New Caledonia were wiped out. Fiji, Samoa, they used to have crocodiles. Now, no. Again, why do you want to share a small island? Um, Hawaii, Hawaii used to have 15 pound giant grazing ducks. Those didn't last very long. And actually, extinctions are, are a feature of human contact. During the last deglaciation, humans became serious actors in the ecology of the world. And what happened is that you had mass extinctions of, kind of, of the large um, mammal genera uh, wherever humans went. 50,000 years ago, there were 150 species of uh, critters larger than 45 kilos. Uh, two thirds of those were gone by 10,000 years ago. 12,000 years ago in North America, you had mammoths, giant beavers. Can you imagine a 220 pound beaver? Mastodons, horses, camels, ground sloths, saber toothed tigers. Humans showed up, all of those were gone. It was Cortez that reintroduced the horse into North America. So what happens as humans show up? Well, it wasn't so bad in Africa, but basically um, everywhere humans showed up after that, where the humans did not evolve with the animals, uh, you got rather abrupt extinctions. So Australia, basically everything, 15 out of 16 genera. Um, these are the percent of large mammal species. North America, 33 out of 54 or 45. Madagascar, big collapse. Uh, South America, 46 out of 58. Um, the same story occurred after the end of glaciation. Every place humans expanded into new, new ranges including fairly small islands, you know, Cyprus, Indian Ocean Islands, Caribbean Islands. So um, changes in the ecology, changes in the environment are inevitable. Just get used to it. Um, just an aside, I wouldn't blame your ancestors for everything. My example is the Irish elk. Its antlers weighed about 90 pounds. So I can, I can see why it went extinct. Anyway, a few historical thoughts for exploration. Externalities are very important and often poorly understood. Um, we inadvertently killed 20% of the world's population discovering the Western hemisphere. Not encouraging. The next time you complain about NASA's Planetary Protection Program, think, uh, remember that. Unintended consequences are the rule, not the exception. You know, the megafauna extinctions everywhere humans migrated. It's a feature, not a bug. Part of the downside of success and riches is the resource disease. And there are very few countries that deal effectively with this. The only one I know of is Norway, actually. And Spain is now only, only now getting over the unintended economic consequences of its bout of resource disease. Not very encouraging. Institutional legal frameworks are very important. Nothing turns off investors and explorers faster than blurry property rights. But the problem is that the age of exploration was also the age of piracy. Watch out for lax enforcement. And really the enforcement issue is one of, of, uh, of jurisdiction because you can be a criminal in one jurisdiction and a hero in another jurisdiction. So if you 
have an asteroid that you're mining and the Chinese cruise by and say, oh, this is my asteroid now because of Chinese law. Um, are they pirates or are they explorers? I don't know. This will be something we'll have to work out. Development of local resources is huge. So all the exploring countries depended upon local resources and advanced bases to extend their reach and actually develop their ex exploration empires. This is something we're going to have to do, and we're working on it. Um, finally, transportation costs are key. They were key in the 1500s, they're key now. The revolution in shipping technology made possible a wide range of exploration, investment, and development. There's a strong analogy here with what's happening with Lockheed and Boeing versus SpaceX. Lockheed and Boeing are building, are still building the present day galleon. And SpaceX and Blue are building the flutes. And you just have to walk out and see the rate of launches uh, in SpaceX relative to the rate, rate of launches in, of, of United Launch Alliance. Um, basically, all the commercial payloads are now on SpaceX because they are so much cheaper. And that has made possible a lot of, of exploration and a lot of development. And a lot, of, a lot of raw craziness, too. I mean, right now, SpaceX is flooding low Earth orbit with their, uh, their little satellite, their little communication satellites. Um, which I can't think, but will be a problem in the future. So anyway, a little bit of historical perspective. Uh, we live in interesting times. And so one of the predictions, the, there are several predictions from this, including that we will probably live to see the first case of space piracy. And the uh, the, the whole development of a space economy. So if you have any questions, let me know. Thank you, Dr. Britt. That was, uh, that was great. <laughs> I know, well, I know there's, I know there's a number of history buffs um, in the club. And history really does repeat itself. And um, well, yeah. it provides some but, insight. And you know, we've faced uh, problems like this before, and managed to screw up the solution over centuries until more or less we evolved into something relatively uh, correct. And right now, you know, there's a lot of discussion. Um, about what space law is, but I don't think anybody has a solution there yet. Yeah, and we do seem to have the same sort of analogous characters and, you know, Bezos and, uh, uh, what's his name, <laughs> I'm having a blank. But you know, are they heroes? Are they pirates? Are they just rich, spoiled people building rockets and, and you know, unintended consequences like filling low Earth orbit with satellites. Um, yeah. You know, and, and SpaceX is just the first, you know, to do this. So um, it's always a painful transition moving forward. Yeah. And, but and when you when they started building the, the flute, Musk. Mm -hmm. what you could do is sail a flute. It was cheap enough and, and, and rugged enough to sail across the Atlantic, fill the, fill the ship up with salted cod and sail it back and you could make money. And that was really the, the, the dawn of what became the economic powerhouse of our world, which is the mm -hmm. integrated North Atlantic economy. Well, I remember yeah. in my lifetime, uh, a speaker was saying, 
if an asteroid was made of solid gold, we still could make money traveling to an asteroid and bringing it back to the Earth. But that may not be true forever. And there may be things on asteroids worth more than gold. Um, these things, yeah. It, 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 it could, well, good perspective that, that you brought. Yeah, and I think that that one of the things we're seeing is that people are looking at asteroids as sources of fuel mm -hmm. for for extending exploration and extending economic activity. Yeah, I really like the idea about um, you know making Cuba the base. Because I've always been that we need to go to the moon and have people living on the moon for a decade before we start thinking about putting people on Mars. And um, yeah. there, there's historical precedent now for that that oh, I yeah. can whip out. So that, that, that makes sense. We do have a few Q and A's. Um, John Pinto says St. Augustine was settled in 1565, so it didn't have to wait until 1607. Um, so true. Yep. But yeah, he's, but, still, uh, 50, but still I, more than 50 I, years later. But. but I live in this climate. I don't think that this is really North America. <laughs> okay. But um, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Um, Frank Kane says, do you see a parallel between modern billionaires self-funding space exploration and the crown in the 15th and 16th century? Or is it totally different with totally different appetites for risk uh, changing the equation? No, I think that's a good, um, a good point of view because uh, Musk and uh, Bezos have many um, aspects of of uh, uh, of monarchs in the 1500s, they're <laughs> they're essentially above the law. They're uh, they're interested in in uh, in creating new possibilities, new investments, and uh, mm -hmm. and they want to shake things up. Remember when Columbus started, Spain was a uh, a second-rate power in and a local power in the Mediterranean, but a second-rate power in uh, Europe. And because it had the gold of the Americas, it became the dominant power in Europe because it could afford to wage war on an unprecedented scale. Um, and that's what that's what all these these monarchs back then were interested in was obtaining resources. I think it's also some of the modern monarchs, <clears throat> the analogies of them anyway, are thinking the same things. There's, there's no telling how a permanent residence on the moon is going to change things. What are we going to find there? Uh, what new technology will be developed that will dramatically change life on Earth? And they're going to be the ones holding the cards when that, you know, when that happens. Yeah. Yeah. So here's, a, here's an off-the-wall question, since there's no other q and um, I'm curious, someone of, of, of your pedigree, have you seen the uh, TV show, um, The Expanse? And if so, yeah. what, did, what did you think of it? I thought they did a better job of that than almost any other. Okay, that great. I've seen because um, they at least make a nod to physics. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, they're, uh, you know, the way they're able to do it is that they form some sort of magic with their um, with their engine technology. But that said, um, everything else seems to seems to work. That the human uh, aspect I thought was very realistic. Yeah. As well, there, there's no way workers on Mars and workers in the asteroid belt aren't going to be exploited. Um, and also resent each other. Mm -hmm. So, all right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, sure. is, does anyone else have any questions? Q&A is empty. We'll let Dr. Britt go. I'm, I'm seeing some thank yous in the chat. So thank you very much. Okay, well. Dr. Brown. Thank you guys for, for having me over. And uh, I'm always uh, always keen to talk to this group. So. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. You very have much. a great day. That was a great, great talk.
a lot of interesting perspective there. So, okay. Okay. Bye. Well, thank you. Bye bye. Next up on our agenda is uh, member astrophotos. Uh, Derek Demeter is going to talk about that. Are you ready to go, Derek? There's a big yes. storm. There's a big storm yeah, rolling is. through Lake Mary right now. So yes. So, <laughs> thankfully, we have multiple hosts. Fingers crossed. If I go down. Yep. Um, it won't end. So. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, for those that are joining for the first time here on the CFIS uh, um, general meeting, um, so every month we curate a bunch of astro photos that have been done by our members. And um, what we have here is we have several members that submitted photos this month. Uh, if you do see your photo, um, I believe if, if, if I don't remember who sent me a photo, just go ahead and raise your hand in the uh, in the participants list and I will uh, allow you to speak. And um, that way you can tell us all about the amazing photo that you, that you took and some other information about that. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen here. I'm gonna go ahead and get the, uh, um, the PowerPoint going on. So, uh, all right. Okay, so what we have here right now is basically, um, ah, ah, there we go. Um, this is the most recent planetary um, lineup in the uh, last couple of, uh, last month back in late June um, and uh, around I think it was June 23rd is when I actually took this photo. Um, we had a very cool opportunity. Uh, Uranus is actually visible in this as well, but uh, it was really hard to see and I didn't want to put too much in there. And I really wanted to focus this image on the uh, naked eye visible planets uh, to get people excited about that. But you can see here, um, we have Mercury on the far left, Venus, the moon, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. And just for fun, I decided to kind of put their respected, uh, of course, approximation. Uh, I didn't want to get exact numbers, but basically a general idea of the distance of each object from the Earth. And uh, what's really cool about this is that all the planets are in their corresponding uh, rank in the solar system. Of course, we have Mercury, then Venus. Moon would represent, of course, the Earth. In this case, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Uh, so this was actually taken over at Hatville Park, which is kind of on the border of Seminole County and Brevard County off the St. Johns River. Uh, early in the morning, around 5.20 a.m., and this was taken with a 14-millimeter um, uh, Rokinon lens at f1 uh, f2 uh, using a Canon 5D Mark IV, um, and uh, just uh, haven't really had a chance to do too much astrophotography uh, due to just the busy schedule I've had with the planetarium renovations, and I was just really excited about doing something. It's been a while since I got a chance to take some photos, and so I wanted to do something really cool and share that with uh, the people. All right, so uh, the next image, I believe, is actually a time lapse. Um, and I'm trying to remember who it was that uh, submitted this photo. Let me actually get the uh, Dropbox here put together. If, if you are here, oh, there we go, John Starr. Thank you, John. Thank you for raising your hand. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and allow you to talk. And uh, this is a time lapse image. So um, I want to go ahead and uh, have you speak about it, and then we'll go ahead and play it. Go ahead, John. Sure, yeah. Um, so good evening, everyone. So this, um, I just spent a week in Yellowstone. Um, and uh, we were very fortunate in that it, it opened back up before, uh, before we got there. Um, if, if you hadn't heard, there was a, some really bad flooding in Yellowstone. And for the first time in its history, 150 year history, it, it was closed. Um, but it opened back up, and, um, and this is about a mile hike up from the lodge. That's Old Faithful in the background that you see there to the right, the geyser that sort of erupts every 90 minutes or so. And so this was taken between 11 p.m. and about 1 a.m. Um, it's, a, it's a little over 400 um, shots or so. And uh, would have been longer, but you can see this path on the left there. Um, a buffalo sort of snuck up on me. Um, it was, it was pretty dark, um, at the end and I, I couldn't see him, uh, but I could smell him and he sort of, he sort of freaked me out a little bit. So, uh, I packed up my stuff and, and, uh, and took off. So I didn't, I didn't stay much longer, but it was really, really beautiful evening this night. Um, what's interesting is it, it's, it stays so 
it stays so bright. It takes a long time for the sun to go down when you're, when you're that far north. Um, so it doesn't really even get dark until around 11 o'clock or so. And then the moon, sort of this um, nice crescent moon was up. And then once that went down, it got, it got really dark. So um, um, you can see right at the beginning of the time lapse when, when Derek plays it here, the um, um, Old Faithful erupt and then Old Faithful erupts again uh, right, right at the end. So. And this, um, this was taken with a, uh, um, what did I take it with? Sigma um, 24, it was a 1424 millimeter. I shot it at 24 millimeter um, F2.8. Uh, in a uh, Canon EOS RA. All right, we'll play it one more time. It's amazing how much light pollution uh, there is over by the visitor center where you can actually see the light of the, uh, the water vapor from the geyser, which is pretty crazy. <laughs> Yeah, you know, um, just to, to show my inexperience, I, I spent one night shooting kind of over near um, Old Faithful. And of course, when I went to process those, like all of them are awful because all the water vapor in the, in the air, right? So um, all the photos were very hazy and, and stuff like that. So um, sort of learned a, learned a lesson there. And it might be hard to see this with the, uh, you know, obviously through Zoom, but there are several satellites that are visible in this image or this, this time lapse, which is kind of neat to also notice that you know, we were talking about satellites in the main program. Um, so just kind of cool to, to actually notice that with these time lapses. All right, well, thank you so much, John. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next photo. Let's see here, there we go. This is a, a Sharif phase photo. And um, I think I did see uh, Sharife said that she was kind of on um, her phone. So I'm actually going to read her description. She submitted it to me. Um, this is actually taken uh, from her recent trip. Uh, it was taken off the coast of Cuba a couple of weeks ago uh, using her uh, iPhone 13 using Nocturne. The exposure was four minutes and there was a lightning storm off in the distance, nothing fancy. Uh, but she wanted to show off the potential of the app. So as you can see here, you can do some amazing astrophotography uh, with your phone. So if you have a opportunity to take a fantastic photo, uh, you know, take out that phone and, and just take the picture. So um, fantastic. Now, um, Shrifei, I don't know if you uh, have anything else that you'd like to uh, mention about the photo at all, but I'm going to let you allow to talk if you want, if you're, if you're able to talk, if not. We can move on. All right. I think you can. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Can yes can. Okay. Yeah. No. You nailed it. That was that was perfect. So yeah, I just wanted to share it with uh, with everybody because something that uh, that anybody could easily do if you have the the phone and stuff. So yeah, just a little bit of practice and there you go. Free app. Oh, all right. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and move on to our next photo. This is from uh, John Pinto. Uh, so, John, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to talk and tell us about this photo. Uh, yeah, so this is another iPhone uh, photo that uh, got up a couple of days after your photo, because uh, as you can see, the moon's a lot uh, closer to the horizon. <clears throat> Probably can't see it in Zoom, but Mercury's kind of in the middle of this. Uh, but the prominent things is obviously the moon and Venus. And we have just suburban neighborhood lights all over the place, but you can still get the nice pictures with your with just your cell phone. Absolutely. So again, if you have if you see that moment, capture it, and we like to see that amazing photo. So thank you so much, uh, John, for sharing that with us. Uh, the next image goes to uh, Frank Kane. So Frank, actually, you have the next couple of photos. So I'll just let you talk for a little while and tell us about your photos. Yeah, thanks. This is uh, M8, the Lagoon Nebula, shot from here in North Merritt Island. Uh, same rig for all these photos. It's going to be a Skywatcher Scar Starlux 190MN telescope on a Paramount Mighty Mount from Software Bisque and a ZWO ASI 2600 mm camera. Uh, this is sort of my uh, dabbling in star removal. So in PixInsight, there's a new thing called StarNet 2 you can get that does a really, really good job of removing stars. And for nebulas like this, it really accentuates the clouds of gas really nicely. So uh, this is in the Hubble palette. Remember Hubble? Yeah, that was the thing like a week ago, uh, the SHO palette there. So it, it kind of like brings out the sort of like golden brown clouds of hydrogen and sulfur around there surrounding that uh, ionized oxygen in the middle there. So 
uh, really happy with how that came out. All right, uh, let's go ahead and move on to the next uh, photo. Yeah, same deal here. This is the Eagle Nebula M16, also shot last month. Uh, same story there, SHO palette, uh, stars removed. And uh, yeah, it just kind of came out kind of artsy that way. Kind of looks kind of painting-y, although it's a little bit, uh, got to bump up the contrast in that. I think it was a little, a little bit washed out on Zoom, so <laughs> uh, but yeah. Nah, I think it looks great to me. Cool, thanks. All right, and then your final image. Yeah, this one I'm really jazzed about. That's the uh, Jellyfish Nebula, IC443. Uh, this was actually shot back in December, but uh, now that I've learned some new tricks about processing, I had another go at processing that data. And uh, for the other astrophotographers in the group, uh, one trick that's proved really valuable is doing star removal before you do deconvolution, which is kind of like uh, fixing the focus of your image. And by doing that, you can uh, get a lot better resolution in the image because it doesn't have to deal with all the stars. And it also lets you process the stars separately. So it really leads to better results. So that's my tip of the week, <laughs> use StarNet too. Uh, but this is about 20 hours of uh, data captured back in December. And uh, again, the Hubble palette, SHO, nothing too fancy. All right, fantastic. Uh, and uh, let's go ahead and um, go to Alex Pettit. He did, uh, he submitted this. Uh, tell us about, tell us about this. Alex, let me go ahead and allow you to talk here. All right, go for it. Am I there? You're there, are we here? Yeah, loud and clear. Okay, well, the image is the lower left, but it requires a little bit of explanation. In the upper right, you see the, the equipment, you see my telescope. It's this uh, radio telescope. I bought it last August, and this has been an ongoing effort over this past year. And uh, the first, the first image that I got with this thing, which was not nearly as quality as the signal that you see in the far upper right, was it was sort of my uh, James Webb moment. The fact that I could actually record the emission from, hyd from hydrogen gas clouds within the Milky Way was just phenomenal. I mean, you think of Arecibo type sized uh, telescopes or, or uh, parabolic dishes and I could do this thing with a, a one meter diameter scope was phenomenal. Okay, so what this is, is the way you do this is you set up, you position, pre-position the telescope at some point and you leave it fixed and let the sky drift by. And this was taken over an eight hour period. Look at the, uh, the upper left, it was set at declination of uh, 40 degrees north. And I started at a right ascension of 16 hours and I, and I left that position sit there for, for eight hours. And what happened was I started to the, I guess, west yeah, west of the of the Milky Way, allow the Milky Way to go overhead and then four hours to the east. And the result of that is uh, it was 100 samples, 100 times samples is shown below. And if you slide over to the uh, lower right, this is what you're looking at. You're looking at the, uh, the Milky Way the galactic longitude around 80 degrees and you're seeing the Perseus and this outer arm. And there's, there's a lot that goes on here because you receive uh, signals, radio frequency signals and store them away in an, in an ASCII file of frequency and amplitude. And then you need to convert that to a velocity but then there are the the velocity data is corrupted by the rotation of the earth but more so by the orbital velocity of the earth um as the rope as the earth rotates once a day it swings in and out you're pointing either uh, perpendicular to or in or out of the orbital motion of the earth and that is like uh, 40 kilometers per second so you have almost a sine wave and velocity changes that has to be subtracted out. So you have to run through a calculation to subtract this out. And what this is showing here is the color. It's uh, like a topographic map of intensity. And so what you are seeing at the, the red area is the strongest region. And this has actually been calibrated 
in relative velocity in kilometers per second. And it has its reference to what's called the local standard of reference. Uh, it's, a, it's a standard that is, says the, the sun and some of the round, surrounding stars are not moving. How else is, how is the rest of the galaxy moving in, in relation to that? So the, the near arm, Perseus is moving away from this. It's a red shift of about uh, eight kilometers per second. And then this outer region is moving towards us at about 75. And I'm just absolutely amazed that I can get anything like this, actually science data with a little backyard portable radio telescope. Thank you so much, Alex. Yes, I agree. Um, being able to do some radio astronomy is uh, quite, quite amazing. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to see more of this uh, in the future and maybe even get a bunch of our members to collaborate and do some radio astronomy uh, work. So um, fantastic job. Thanks. Well, uh, that, that is pretty much uh, my, my, um, my collection of astrophotos that were submitted. So uh, be sure to... Uh, you know, keep sending those images. Um, of course, this is the kind of worst time of the year to do astrophotography, but uh, um, you know, we'll we'll keep uh, we'll keep going on. Hopefully, we'll get some clear skies, and uh, we'll see some additional opportunities for astrophotography. So, I'll bring it back to you, Richard. Thanks. Only back to me for a minute. Uh, Mauricio is up. Our uh, CFIS member for quite some time moved away, but in the virtual world we live in now. Distance has no bearing whatsoever. Mauricio, are you ready to take it away? Yes, I am. All right, it's all yours, son. All right, hello, everybody. Uh, it is great to be back on. I missed you all dearly. Um, so I've been asked to come on and sort of talk about um, my recent experience having joined the um, Cox Science Center and Aquarium in West Palm. Uh, so let me go ahead and start sharing my screen here so I can tell you all about it. Let me see. Okay, I think everyone can see and hear me okay. Okay, so um, yeah, so I am a part-time uh, science Hold on a second here. I am a part-time um, science educator at the uh, Cox Science Center and Aquarium, I'm hoping to be full-time soon. Um, so there's some opportunities coming up there. The reason that I kind of got interested in this was because of my experience as the outreach chair um, for the Central Florida Astronomy Society. Um, it was a really great experience. And the only reason that uh, I'm not up there with you guys still is I, I had kind of a big life change and I decided that the best thing for me would be to move back to South Florida um, and be kind of closer to family. And, but I was inspired um, with my experience and I decided that um, I really wanted to pursue a career um, in some sort of science education, okay? And so um, I'm gonna start by kind of just giving a quick tour um, of the science center so you can see what it's like inside. And then um, I will sort of talk to you about what it is that I actually do there. So um, as you can see here, um, it is mostly a one story building. It is not a very large science center. Um, if you compare it to the likes of the Orlando Science Center or um, the Miami uh, Frost Science Center, if anyone has, has been there, which is um, pretty massive. And, um, but that doesn't mean it's not an awesome place to go. If you come and really take the time to look at each exhibit and explore everything, um, you can easily spend several hours there as I did when I first um, joined. Uh, there are some plans in the near future to upgrade this thing. So as you can see here, this is a, a, a computer uh, render or a computer generated image of the new plans for the center. Um, so everyone's pretty excited about that because it means that the education department, which is what I'm a part of, will be able to expand into the old center. And then a lot of the exhibit space will be moved over here. So it's gonna give us a lot more office space, a lot more resources, et cetera, et cetera. 
Okay, so once you enter the uh, Science Center, probably the first thing that you'll notice is their aquarium. Um, it is a, a relatively small aquarium, but it is very beautiful. Um, it has this kind of circular design that you walk around and main tank. Um, but as far as aquariums go, it is kind of what you would expect if you've been to, um, you know, any other science center or small aquarium, okay? They have little gators um, and they have a, uh, some really cool puffer fish. Um, this is a close-up of uh, Florida gar, little baby gar. Um, don't ask me what some of these fish are because um, I did not have the time to memorize the names. But uh, of course they have a, um, you know, Florida ecology section. You've got to have it if you're going to be in Florida Science Center. Uh, but once you move past that kind of introductory area, um, there's this thing called Science on a Sphere. And so Science on a Sphere is a very cool um, kind of exhibit. It is a sphere, a spherical sort of screen that has four different projectors that align to show all sorts of things. Like this is kind of a more artistic rendering of the Earth. That is just what it happened to be playing when I came by to take this photo. But they have, um, you know, they have the actual Earth. They have Mars. Pretty much any 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 planet in the solar system that has a, a, a full surface, um, you know, data. Which is, I think, at this point, like all of them, um, those will be presented on there. Um, and then they also show like moving images, videos, um, things about. Uh, like the climate and everything. So it's a very useful sort of resource to show people um, all sorts of things. I actually had the, the luck that um, our education director, Chris, who you see in the bottom right, is actually calibrating the sphere. And I got to see the grid patterns that appear when they, you know, when they align the projectors. And that was awesome because I actually always wondered how the heck do you um, align you know, a 360 image, right? Like this is this is a, a concave sphere. You know, planetariums are an inverted, right, projection from the inside, but it's the same concept. I always wondered how do these things get, um, you know, aligned and everything. So it's actually pretty simple. You just, you know, kind of nudge each projector until the grid lines line up. And, you know, Chris was able to do it in just a matter of minutes. So that was pretty cool watching him do that. All right, so moving on. There's this um, kind of large, uh, it's definitely um, geared towards smaller visitors, younger visitors. Um, it's kind of like a, um, kind of like a big puzzles room where um, kids go and kind of interact with all these different exhibits. And my understanding is uh, they tend to have something different from time to time. Um, I really enjoyed this part. This is a temporary exhibit um, that was, uh, give, are blended to us from the Max Planck Institute and shows um, high quality prints of different things like electron microscope uh, images, which is uh, on the on the on the on the far right, and I believe on the on the far right is definitely electron microscope. I think the far left might be um, a different type of image from. Uh, it almost looks like capillaries, um, and then we also have printed images of simulations. You can actually see in the uh, the second from the right. I'm pretty sure that's a either it's either merging black holes or neutron stars, um, and so there's all sorts of cool um, images on display from the Max Planck Institute. Um, so once you finish up in this area, you kind of enter what we call the um, the exhibit hall, right? And so here you see um, interactive. Um, displays from physics. Um, you've got a thing that you crank to generate energy. Um, there's a cl your classic plasma ball, which you know you have to have if you're uh, doing a, a physics demonstration. Um, this is the puzzles area of it, which is actually, it may seem juvenile, but it's actually incredibly difficult. <laughs> I actually spent most of my time uh, on my first visit trying to figure out these puzzles and I had to cheat on a, on a few of them. So I was very uh, disgraced and disappointed in myself because they're actually quite challenging. Um, uh, this is another corner of the exhibit. These uh, boys are um, messing around with uh, iron filaments in water and showing how you can move them with magnets and create like the, uh, the magnetic field patterns, which are always really cool to, to visualize using iron filaments. 
Um, this is a, a physics simulator that shows the different types of injuries you can get to your head depending on the velocity and weight of an object and why you should always you know wear a you know a helmet when you ride your bicycle you know etc cetera, etc cetera, um which is a pretty cool thing okay this is one of the the physics um i got a horrible picture of it because i it is really hard to capture the electricity but um this is jacob's ladder and basically it shows how the electrons um repel off each other as they climb up this um this coil right and so basically like their own um their own repulsion causes them to to move up the ladder which i thought was pretty cool um this is a rotating uh microscope display and so you can just rotate the disc um and look at the different household objects and i like it because they let you actually focus the image and so right now it's on a copy beam and um you know, it looks better in person, obviously, because I took a, a photo of the screen, but this is a pretty cool thing to look at. Um, some more microscopes that have, uh, the one on the left has actual slices of animal brains, which is pretty cool. And then the one on the right is um, actually, unfortunately, it, at the time it was, um, I think it was frozen or something, like the tablet was frozen, but I'm pretty sure it's, it's showing um, like human brain structures so they have very cool things on display here's your classic tornado simulator and a hurricane um, wind simulator in the back um, and then this is I'm, I'm my understanding is that this is our current uh traveling exhibit it's like the big one um it's on the human brain what you're seeing here is an actual human brain and nervous system which i thought was really cool and creepy um here's a close-up of it so you can see it's pretty real um and it's really interesting seeing like the nerves um on display because the brain and, and nerves is so complex but when you see it on a macro scale it really just looks like old chicken you know so it's amazing that these structures are so uh, fine um on a microscopic level but uh the, you enter this sort of um it's almost it almost looks like a control room but it's basically just like another brain center a giant model of the brain showing all of the different um parts i learned a lot because i don't know much um about um medical biology is kind of like my weakest scientific uh scientific discipline in the back you can see it's actually my favorite thing in the in the whole museum is um it's a fully 3d um explorable brain right so um here's another kind of zoomed out version of it showing like all the different regions of the brain um here's a close-up so you pick a region and it tells you about it and then you dive you dive further in and further in and further in so there's six layers that you can dive down to this is the uh, synapses uh, showing how the chemical um you know receptors are are, are transmitted and, and, and all that and what's really cool is i'm thinking oh this is this a pre-rendered image um and it's not it's actually fully um a fully interactive 3d model so it's just like i was blown away by the intricacy of it um and then they have a real uh this is the blood um circulatory system of the brain which is pretty cool Okay, so this is getting to the parts that you're all interested in. And I'm kicking myself for not taking a picture of the door of the planetarium because um, it's actually very similar to the one in a uh, seminal state in that it's sort of the entrance is integrated inside the building. So the, the main exhibit hall that I showed you with all the puzzles and all the, all the interactive things, you walk around that, um, Actually, when you walk into it, you're actually greeted by the planetarium is the first thing they agree with, which I think is cool that it's just kind of flows into it because I went to the Miami uh, Frost Museum, which probably has the biggest planetarium possibly in, in the nation. If you haven't gone, it's super crazy. Um, I do recommend going. It's a really intense experience because the screen is so big, you feel like you're about to fall your seat. Um, but the entrance to it is like separate from the main building. So you, it's like outdoors and then you walk in. I like the way it is ours where it's like, it's just integrated into the, to the main hall. I think it flows really nicely. So here 
people are um, getting ready for a show. You can see it's about the same size, maybe slightly bigger than the planetarium we have. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit, um, but I do wanna point out the two giant telescopes that they have to the left and to the right of the control console. Um, I haven't gotten a chance to mess with those yet, but super lucky. Um, the week that I came on, which is about two weeks ago, um, I met a girl um, in the education building who is doing an externship. So it's kind of like the reverse of an internship. She's lending her, um, her services to the Cox Center because she is an actual um, elementary, a public elementary school astronomy teacher with the planetarium in her school, which blew me away when I heard of it because I didn't know, I didn't realize that was a thing. And so I've actually, um, I befriended her and then she let me shadow her as she created a, um, a moon program uh, for us to use in the future, right? So I was able to sit down, watch how the planetarium gets booted up. I've been able to learn a lot about the software that we use. And so at this point, if I had to, I could probably do a rudimentary program on the planetarium. I still have a lot to learn, um, but I'm lucky that I came on when I did because the unfortunate reality about the planetarium is that there's, there's currently two part-time employees that run it. And for the most part, they come in, they, uh, you know, when it's showtime, they greet people, they give some rules, they hit play, and then a movie plays. And so to, to um, give you an example, here's one of our movies, it's Black Holes, The Other Side of Infinity. So it's a black, you know, shows like the, you've probably seen on YouTube, it's like one of the, um, one of the famous like uh, physics simulated black hole renderings, right? And it takes you right on through. It's narrated by Liam Leeson. Uh, Leeson's a pretty cool program. You know, here's a shot of Earth and a satellite. Um, but, um, and this is what I really want to talk about, is I'm seeing this sort of trend in planetariums where they're moving away from um, what we do at the Seminole State Planetarium, which is we have the actual um, star simulator in the center. And that's sort of um, a hybrid with the projection system. So, like at, at you know Seminole State, um, Derek can give a really accurate simulation of um, the actual sensation of looking at at stars in, in a clear sky and a dark sky. Um, and then you can also combine that with, like, say, you wanted to explore the solar system, look at the planets, or you know, look at the whole galaxy. Like we have we have uh, space simulators that you can project as like a separate um, application, right? Um, unfortunately, we do not have the, the central star projector, the old school star projector that Seminole State has. And so all we can do is run um, universe simulators, which, you know, you can either zoom out into space and look at stuff, or you can stay on earth, you know, and do a kind of a more traditional um, nighttime show. So at 2 p.m. every day, um, the part-time employees that run the planetarium, they do get to do a traditional, um, you know, tour of the night sky. And each person kind of does their own thing. Like one guy does a, a more um, traditional show like the constellations. And then another girl she does, she's more about zooming through the solar system, showing people the planets and stuff. So you get kind of a variety. So I am happy that we do have an interactive show. Um, and what I'm really excited about is this, this girl who is um, externing for the Science Center, she's creating a moon program, and then she's also creating um, a solar system program. So we're going to have three, um, instead of just the one, we're going to have three interactive plant, uh, planetarium programs, um, Nights Above the Palm Beaches, which is your supposed to be your traditional constellations program, um, a, a program about the moon, um, you know, the phases, how it was created, landing on the moon and looking at earth is pretty cool and then um we're gonna have our solar system launch, which she's still writing and i'm hoping to help her um in the planetarium this week and next week so we'll see what that's all about um but i'm excited because if i ever do get to and everyone that works here knows by now that i'm obsessed with space so um i think they'll keep that in mind that hopefully i'll have the opportunity to you know get a few hours into the planetarium and hopefully give these shows um they do weddings 
apparently that I pulled this from the internet. Um, and yeah, uh, I actually have a couple that got married in the Orlando Science Center. Um, but this sort of idea is kind of cool of having like the nice sky above while you do your, um, I don't know if the actual ceremony was held here. They, they probably just did pictures, but, um, but yes, yeah, so this is our, this is the CFATS uh, plant here, which, you know, I know this got decommissioned. So I, I, I don't know what the future of that is. Maybe you can tell me Richard or Derek after, after my show, but um, I don't know if we'll still have that old school projector in the middle. But so that, that thing in the middle is basically what our planetarium is lacking. And this is, this is the trend that newer planetariums seem to be going is, is they're, they're, they're killing the, the old school star machine and they're just relying on um, projectors and uh, universe simulators, which is great, but um, it's, it's kind of like how when you look at stars on a screen, um, you don't get the same sensation as when you simulate stars using these things because, um, you know, I attended one of Derek's shows and it was super accurate to how it felt like looking at stars in the night sky. So I'm a little bit sad about that, but it is still a lot of fun to do stuff with the planetarium. Uh, okay, so on to the observatory. Um, so we have a kick-ass observatory. This, uh, I pulled this image from Facebook actually, um, but so I think every other Friday, it's like two Fridays a month, we do what's called nights at the museum um, where uh, museum members and the public come out and you know they they mingle in the in the museum of course but then they also have the opportunity to um, come up and look through the observatory and my my understanding is we also do adult events like similar to um, the Orlando Science Center's uh, what do you call it the uh, Science Night Live with alcohol and all that stuff apparently we do adult adult centers like that too or adult uh, you know adult themes but um, yeah, so I here's what's interesting about the observatory. Um, apparently, none of the staff at the center actually run it or know how to run it. It actually was built and is operated by the um, the Astronomy Society of the Palm Beaches. Okay, so that's um, you know upon hearing that, oh, I got right on top of joining. Um, because, you know, I want to be, I'm hoping that, you know, they'll teach me how to operate this thing. And there's talk in the Science Center that we want, we want our future to be um, Science Center staff to know how to do this thing, right? So, so um, unfortunately, I've had kind of a slow start with the society down here because um, I missed my first virtual meeting because I had a flat tire. So I didn't make that meeting. Um, and I think because of bad weather, we had to, to cancel one of our events. But I'm trying to get into some outreach because what I've learned through CFAS is if, if you want to, you know, get really become a part, an integral part of a, of a club, a science club, um, doing outreach is a really good way to do that. So I'm hoping to get some outreach in this month and maybe start meeting some of the uh, Astronomy Society members because I am excited about our future here. Uh, this is a... a image of their uh, control console. It's kind of a mess, but um, apparently it's powered by a uh, Raspberry Pi is, uh, or maybe not powered, but like the interface is done with a uh, Raspberry Pi, which is, I think the thing in the middle, uh, there's like a little box in the middle with the keyboard, white keyboard on top of it. I think that's the Raspberry Pi, but I don't know much about um, all that stuff. Um, and then this is a view from the outside. You can see the two domes, planetarium on the left, and the observatory on the right. Um, all right, so Cox Science Center. All right, so that, that's kind of the tour. So I wanna talk about now, what, what do I do, right? And, and going in, I kind of had a misconception about um, what it is that I would be doing. I kind of had this idea that I would be an internal employee in the museum, kind of giving tours or you know, giving programs, talking you know, to people. And the reality is that the education department actually spends most of its time throughout the year. We spend a lot of our time going out to schools um, and we have a, a large number of programs that we present at these schools, either during school hours or after school hours. And um, basically how it works is either the schools pay us directly, like maybe it's a, a, a well-to-do school 
they have the funds, maybe it's a private school, you know, they can afford it. So they'll pay us to come out, give a program. Um, but then you have your Title I schools, you're like, you know, you're, you're kind of more in need schools. And there's, um, there's foundations that will, you know, give grants and, and give funding for these schools then to be able to, um, you know, pay us to come out. Um, and so that right now, that's what we're doing in summertime. It's actually, a, you know, during summertime, school's out. So you've got all your summer camps and you've got summer camps in the science center. That's like our biggest source of, of income, actually, throughout the year, apparently. And then you've got summer camp science, summer camps at schools. Um, and that's that's really what I've been doing is I've been shadowing other educators to come out to these summer camps at schools. And we give hour long programs, um, usually back to back. Um, so we usually do like uh, maybe like third, fourth and fifth graders. Um, and then either like maybe first and second graders or sixth and seventh graders in a different group. And so, um, yeah, so I, I barely actually, I don't spend that much time in the actual museum. Usually we're running around town uh, trying to get programs. So what I'd like to do here is uh, I'm gonna show you, do I have another picture? Yes, okay. So one, um, one of the programs that we do is called Tech Trek. Um, and it involves, it's a couple things. It involves um, having students build um, Play-Doh models, and then they use an iPad app to uh, scan the model and actually creates a 3D model based on that, textures it based on the image, and then it creates like a Mario-like game for them to play with their, with their Play-Doh model. The next step is we show them some basic 3D modeling which is really cool. That's like one thing that I'm very familiar with, um, again, with like a basic iPad app. Um, and then after that, we teach them coding um, with these robots, right? So there's these robots called Dash, um, and we use a, a software called Blockly to sort of code them. So you connect your Dash via Bluetooth to the iPad. And so here is a, uh, a code that I, met, I, I created. So the, the code goes, um, look straight, um, set the, the left, the right wheel as fast for the first, first motion, then the left wheel as fast for the second motion, turn right, move forward, look right, look up, make a, like an angry eye pattern is what I have it set for, and then turn right. So um, I'm gonna show you here what that would sort of look like. So let me bring this up. And places. So when I hit, so once I execute this command, this is kind of what the robot will do. Hopefully, this is smooth. All right. So that was a, a very basic. That took me like you know five minutes to program, maybe less. And um, you can do a lot more crazy, fun things, and the kids love it. Um, unfortunately, it is pure chaos when you've got, you know, 20 uh, fourth and fifth graders and they're all playing with the, you know, we get break them up into groups of two or three, give them robots. It's insanity. So <laughs> you just don't have the, um, the sort of calm and peaceful and focused environment you would need to, to teach them um, a truly complex movement. But they get the gist and it gets them excited about robotics and programming and all that stuff. And obviously, this is very, it's not, it's not true programming or coding because we're using, you know, a preset UI, but um, it's kind of like nodes, right? So if you've, if you've ever done stuff in like After Effects or anything like that, and you're connecting um, nodes together to create like a certain desired effect, it's very much like that. All right. So the next thing I'd like to show you, we have another program called, um, so it's called um, Health Science in Motion, and there's four parts. Um, part three is about the cells. And so we have this cool um, activity we do where they color a cell, and then we use an iPad to create an augmented reality sort of experience for them. So this is what it looks like. So there's our 3D cell. The 3D model is pre-installed in the program, but it textures it based on your coloring job, which is very cool. And then I couldn't do this because I was holding a phone in one hand, an iPad in the other, but if you click on it, 
it then shows you, it, it opens the cell and it shows you all the different parts, right? So um, I've got a little, another clip here. So you can see the insanity when you have all the kids doing it. So this is a student, I'm trying to help them get the image to work. Uh, 128 seconds. Yeah, bring it out a little bit. You have to be a little farther away. Yes, perfect. All right, if you are finished, grab your cell drawing. All right, so, you know, that's kind of what that situation is like. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot of other programs that we do that was really just the uh, the tip of it, just to show you some of the kind of technology that we use. Um, the challenge, the biggest challenge is that um, they don't like to share. So um, sometimes it's hard to get them, you know, you, they start whining, complaining, one kid's hogging it. So like, that's actually the biggest challenge of the whole job is that you're dealing with all these kids and, you know, you need the counselors, the camp counselors to help you quiet them down and all this stuff. And, you know, you need to, you need to know how to communicate to like little kids, scientific con concepts and stuff like that. Um, so another one, I, I, I didn't take pictures of it because it's, it's more complex, but we did another uh, program where we extract visible DNA from, um, pea juice, right? Like we blend peas together and then we use, um, uh, we use a, a soap, dish soap, um, meat tenderizer, which works as an enzyme and then alcohol. So, so the, um, the soap breaks apart the pea cells, um, the enzymes unravel the, or like unravel the chromosomes and then the alcohol, sorry. And then the salt in the enzymes bonds to the DNA and then the alcohol causes the DNA to um, undissolve, you know, cause it can't dissolve in, in alcohol. So it, you start seeing visible strands of DNA clusters, like a, it's like a white cloud basically, but um, so the kids like them. So, all right, well, so that's just kind of like a few examples of what we do. Um, astronomy programs, apparently we do have some astronomy programs that we teach them. I haven't seen any of them yet. Um, they don't really seem to do a whole lot of that on the educational side, but um, I'm seeing some opportunities because I've seen some telescopes lying around. They're like small scopes. They look like they cost maybe 100, 150 bucks. It's like perfect to bring to a school. So I've seen about three of those lying around. And so I'm trying to pitch this idea of doing a program where we bring out telescopes, have them set up the telescope, align the telescopes, and then have simulated uh targets for them to to because this would be a daytime this would be a daytime uh project or a program but i had this idea of making dioramas like black boxes with suspended planets that are lit and basically providing kind of a, a simulated experience of what it's like to set up a telescope align it and then find your target um so hopefully Maybe someday they'll like that idea and we get to do it. But, um, but yeah. So I do see some a lot of opportunities in the future that I might have for all this stuff. So uh, let me stop sharing. And I see some comments here. Hold on. Okay. Seeing if they're okay. I want to hear about this moon program. Yes, Richard. Um, all right trying to find what the first comment was. Um, okay, yes. Thank you, Elaine. I appreciate that. Um, it was a lot of fun and I hope I get to do it down here too. Um, okay, so yes, the moon program. So Richard, basically what the moon program is, is um, we basically start in the daytime and we show people how, um, You've got the half the half moon, otherwise the quarter moon, um, and the sun. And it's like the the moon's out during the day. Like it's a misconception that it's not right. And then we zoom. We go out into space. We zoom in on the moon, um, and we start time out the phases. Right. So we can show a three dimensional sort of um, process so that they can visibly see 
where the position of the, the moon and the, and the earth is versus the sun. We talk about the, the geocentric orbit, why you can only see one side of the moon. Then we go and land on the moon, right? And then we show on the moon, you see the earth and we show them how the, the earth sits still when you're standing on the moon because of the geocentric orbit, right? So it doesn't really move much in the sky, but it does spin and you see all the phases of the earth passing by. Um, and then once we've done talking about that, we zoom, we, we take off from the moon um, and we start showing all the different places where we've landed. Um, and then we zoom back to earth and um, talk about like lunar eclipses. We talk about uh, um, sat like, you know, satellites on earth for like the moon being a natural satellite. Um, and then we have our artificial satellites and stuff like that. Um, is it possible to present this over Zoom? Sorry? I'm talking about in the future, is it possible to present this over Zoom? Um, probably. Um, it might be able to be filmed, you know, you can set up a, a tripod and maybe like, you know, a camera or something. Um, I'm trying to think of how, uh, I'm trying to think of how you could present um, a planetarium show virtually. Um, Derek has done this once or twice. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure it'd be totally possible. So, I, you know, we could talk about a collaboration down in the future. Am, am I short on time, by the way, or am I the last program, or is there something after me? I have two more after you, which uh -oh. are both, which are right. both me, and they won't be very long. Okay. All right, I better wrap this up. But, um, but, yeah, all right, so we got some comments about the, the projection system. Okay. Good. Um, all right, I'm not seeing any, okay, I'm not seeing any questions. So I think we can, we can wrap this up, but thank you guys for, for having me. It's been exciting to share. Thanks. Um, it's good to see you again. Yeah. It's, it's great sure. seeing, we're seeing you guys. All right. Take care of everybody. All right. Thanks, Mauricio. So next up, uh, I'll be closing out with two mini programs. I'm going to talk about uh, the James Webb Space Telescope and the Grand Canyon Star Party. So should, should have you out of here before too long. So um, if, if you've, you have to have been under a rock uh, to not see all the pictures from the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, but I thought I would, I would run through them real quick. This is not gonna be a, uh, a long in-depth James Webb Space Telescope um, presentation, but just a few interesting points, uh, talking points about each of these images. Um, I wanted to kind of talk about the telescope itself, uh, just so you know something about it. It's about a million miles from Earth, so it's a lot further away than the Hubble Space Telescope is, and it's directly opposite uh, of the Earth from the Sun. Uh, it has a giant shield, which you can see here on the bottom, which keeps the sunlight off the mirrors. Uh, and the mirrors are coated in gold. So your telescopes are either silver or aluminum, most likely aluminum uh, coated. Um, and these are actually gold uh, coated. Uh, note the supporting arms, which are going to create some uh, diffraction, diffraction spikes uh, like a Newtonian telescope. Here's another view from the online simulator. I got this off the James Webb's. Uh, website, which I'll have a link for at the end of the presentation. Uh, you can see the, the sun shield is, you know, keeping the sun so that the um, telescope is very cold. It's a near infrared instrument, so it's looking for uh, very faint infrared, which is basically the heat uh, radiating off of, of objects. Um, Astrophotographers, uh, we like to cool our cameras sometimes, you know, down to 20 below uh, cel uh, zero Celsius. But the James Webb Space Telescope is operating at negative 240, uh, which is around 400 degrees below uh, zero Fahrenheit. So it's, it's very, very uh, cold. One of the nice things about the infrared wavelengths is you can see through uh, many clouds of dust. Now, you, if there's enough dust, you can't see through it, obviously. Uh, but uh, you can look into things like the Orion Nebula, which are very dusty, and you can see more stars uh, through with infrared wavelengths than you can uh, with optical uh, wavelengths. This is actually also this is true from Earth. Uh, many amateur astronomers will use infrared uh, filters and will shoot things like I said, like the Orion Nebula. 
Uh, being in space, of course, gives you a far greater, uh, many orders of magnitude, more sensitivity uh, for being able to do this. So our first uh, photo is uh, SMAX 0723, uh, which is kind of the, the James Webb uh, deep field. Um, it's a very small speck, speck of sky, 2.4 arc minutes across. Uh, there's five people listening who know what that means. Uh, for the rest of you, uh, it's, two, it's about 3.4 Jupiters wide, um, or as uh, you know, they said on the press conference, if you held a grain of sand you know, an arm's length, it's about that much of the sky. So it's a very, very tiny uh, speck of the sky. This is the deepest uh, image of any area of the sky ever taken to date. Um, so it's, it's you know, pretty, pretty impressive. It's overflowing with galaxies that have never been observed before and recorded. Thousands of galaxies here. Um, the cool thing here is this is a composite, of course, made up of multiple wavelengths, and then they, they colorize it. Uh, but all of the things you see are, are really there. Um, the Hubble Deep Field uh, took, uh, let's see, did I write it down here? It took weeks to do the Hubble Deep Field. This is 12 and a half hours of exposure time with the James Webb. The James Webb just totally trounces Hubble. I love Hubble like everybody else does. But in terms of sensitivity, in terms of uh, the resolution, and in terms of what it can see compared to the Hubble, uh, it, is, it is truly a monumental uh, upgrade. Um, these galaxies are about 4.6 billion light years away, or at least the furthest ones away are. And what's really cool is there's a gravitational lens going on here. They didn't talk about this at all when the president and vice president were patting themselves on the back for a 20 year project with international partners. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm supposed to get political, but it is an international project uh, and it has taken many administrations, uh, you know, time uh, to do this. I think there's actually a Republican, um, I don't know if she's a Republican or not. There, there's a Senator up in Maryland somewhere that, that single-handedly may have saved James Webb Telescope when it was running over on money, they wanted to cancel it. Um, anyhow, where were we? Uh, gravitational lensing. This is so cool. So here's a little bit of a close up here. There's a cluster of galaxies right here in the center. Uh, if you can see my mouse and these, uh, these round galaxies, this is called gravitational lensing. And what that is, is the light from these galaxies behind this other galaxy group, the galaxy group that has so much gravity that the light going past it is warped and bent towards it. Uh, this is a confirmation of Einstein's theories. Uh, it was first validated in the early 20th century by looking at starlight that was actually bent by our own sun uh, during a total eclipse of the sun. But we now see this now in space uh, around these galaxies. It's just so cool. Uh, the next image is not an image of an object at all. It's actually a spectrum, spectral readings from an exoplanet, WASP-96b. Sounds like a great name for a science fiction destination. Um, most of what we know is a, about the universe and what the universe is made of off of Earth. Uh, we get from analyzing the light that we receive from them. Either the object giving off light has spectra, which tells it its chemical foot, uh, fingerprint, or light passing through the material is altered by the types of material. And that also gives us a fingerprint that we can identify uh, what, what what the materials are made of. And this exoplanet is jam-packed with water. Uh, lots of H2O uh, in the atmosphere. Now, this is a giant, this is a, a, a giant a gas giant, not as big as Jupiter, but it's orbiting very close to the sun, uh, to its star, which is actually a sun-like uh, star, uh, but it's very, very hot. And so uh, they've detected the presence of water molecules as well as um, haze and, and well, evidence for haze and clouds, not conclusive, we say supporting evidence uh, for haze and clouds in the atmosphere. Uh, so it's probably very hot there. Uh, it's actually closer to its star than Mercury is to the sun. It may be even as hot as um, Florida in July and August. The next image is the Southern Ring Nebula. This can actually be observed from here in Florida. Uh, it does, it gets slightly higher above the southern horizon than Omega Centauri, uh, actually. Uh, this is a beautiful planetary nebula, NGC 3132, if you want to look it up in your astronomy programs. There's a dim star at the center that's been sending out 
uh, blowing off all these uh, all these shells of gas. The bright star with the with the uh, specks is actually not yet. Let me just switch over here and get my mouse. It's actually this little tiny star right here at the end of this diffraction spike uh, that has actually created all of that. And um, we've never, we, this is the most detailed view of a planetary nebula ever taken by humankind. Um, you know, it, it's, it's really cool. I, I've seen some, some posts on Facebook from my, you know, my non-science geeky friends. Uh, and they're like, so these are kind of pretty, but we spent a lot of money and, you know, I've seen better, prettier pictures. The point of these, this telescope is not to make pretty pictures. It's to do science. Um, and we make some pretty pictures to keep the public happy so that the, they don't mind paying taxes to pay for all of this. Uh, but the pretty pictures are just icing on the cake. The real cake, the real meat is the science that we're getting. And we're able to explore the universe in unprecedented uh, detail. And, you know, the more we find, and what, one of the fundamental things we found out is things really far away in the universe work the same way they do on Earth. The laws of physics are the same there as they are here. So if we see something interesting going on in the universe that we didn't know about, um, it tells us something about how things work here on Earth as well. And, uh, you know, a great, there are many books written on the topic of how, you know, I'm just curious and I'm poking around and it led to a discovery that changed the course of humanity or, and saved lots of lives. So it's a very, um, it, it's a very ignorant, well, uneducated, but ignorant is a, a more prerogative you know, it's, it's a little less nice way to say it, but it really is simply, uh, you know, a, a lack of um, education about the history of science and technology and how that that marches forward. Anyway, enough editorializing. I am literally preaching to the choir here at the Astronomy Club. Um, <clears throat> next is Stefan's Quintet, one of my favorite galaxy clusters. Actually, I've shot it many times. I am not going to show you a comparison of my photo to the James Webb photo. My photo did not look nearly as great and it is not nearly this high of resolution. This area of the sky is about one fifth of the moon's diameter. Uh, and this is a really huge, this is actually the largest mosaic. So they took um, over a thousand separate image files. Um, let's see my notes here. It's 150 million pixels uh, constructed of a thousand image files. And of course, you know, we can see this in, in detail that we've never been able to see before. And a lot of things that showing up in infrared that we can't see optically as well, such as these shock fronts here, uh, you know, how these galaxies, these are actually close together and they're actually interacting together. And that tells us something about how, um, you know, how galaxies form and how, they're, how they evolve over time uh, in space. So again, unprecedented detail. Uh, we can actually resolve individual stars and star clusters in these galaxies. Um, we have been able to do that before in the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, this is amazing that we're doing this in galaxies that are much further away. Uh, the Andromeda galaxy, by the way, is the closest galaxy uh, to the Earth, and it's really big. It's like six full moons across in the sky. So there's a giant galaxy hanging overhead. Um, it's too dim to see. Uh, if you photograph it, we can resolve stars. Hubble did it uh, back in, uh, you know, a long time ago, which is why Hubble's name is attached to a lot of, a lot of stuff. Next, uh, oh, so I zoomed in a little bit here so you can see the galaxies um, in a little bit more detail. All of these images, by the way, are on the web, uh, the full resolution are available on the, on the website. Next, we have a portion of the Carina Nebula, NGC 3324. This also gets above the horizon, ha, two degrees. So good luck photographing this from Florida. You're going to need to go, um, you're going to need to move to go south. Uh, this is a little tiny piece of it. It's only a portion of the Carina Nebula. Uh, it's called the Cosmic Cliffs. Uh, and of course, captured in infrared uh, light, well, actually multiple wavelengths in near infrared. Uh, that were color coded to create this uh, beautiful image. One of the great things about this is Hubble did shoot the same region, and we see we see more stars uh, than Hubble can see because the infrared is piercing through a lot of the dust. And of course, as you can see, you can't completely see through all the dust, uh, but you can see through quite a bit of dust. So it does reveal more information, more detail uh, about these structures. Uh, these mountains, my mouse, the big ones here are about seven light years high. 
Uh, so it's, it's pretty cool. For more information or uh, and animations and uh, downloading data, go to web.nesa.com, uh, .gov, sorry, uh, web, W-E-B-B, uh, dot nesa dot gov, and you'll see, you can learn more about that. So there you go. And that concludes the hub, the web telescope. Let me see. I hope there's not, I didn't look to see if there's any questions. I'm hoping there's not because, well, I'll go back to that. Do, do, do. Why can't I bring up Zoom? Bring all to front. Come on. I've got to stop sharing my screen, so it, so I'm not going to do that. We'll we'll do Q and A later if there's uh, if there's any remaining questions. So my last the last mini program for the night is um, on the Grand Canyon Star Party. Not your average uh, star party. This is my third in person Grand Canyon Star Party in the last five years. Uh, I'm a big fan. I plan to go every year. Uh, uh, much like I do the Winter Star Party now. The previous two years were virtual due to the pandemic. Um, so I was really excited to return this year. In fact, I've not been to a real star party in over two years uh, because of the Grand Canyon. Uh, the natural beauty of the Grand Canyon during the day is world renowned, of course. Uh, but uh, this event celebrates dark skies, and the beauty and uh, benefits of a dark sky, natural history. And of course, it promotes uh, environmental awareness. Um, when you attend this, this is not like uh, most of the star parties that we're, we're familiar with. Um, we come to this as you're a volunteer ranger. So they solicit amateur astronomers and professionals to come to the star party and serve as a volunteer ranger. And, and like for reals, uh, you are an interpretive ranger of the night sky. Uh, you, you don't get paid, uh, but you're actually covered by workman's comp as you get hurt, you know, on the job don't fall off a cliff or anything like that uh you get an employee discount at the grand canyon venues things like that and of course free uh admission to the park i really hate the word free because it's like you're doing something i'm working and you get free and it's like you get a free paycheck at the end of uh you know at the end of your work period um anyway you get admission to the park as part of it um and you set up at six and tear down at 11 uh or you can stay as late as you want uh past 11. Uh, that's about a five hour plus shift. So it's, um, you know, it's work uh, to, to do it. So if you are really into outreach, this is your Mecca. This is, uh, you're going to get uh, a lot of it. Uh, you do ser uh, you do have to sit up and tear down each night. There are some people this year, first time ever I've seen leaving their stuff up. Um, I'll get some pictures of that. Um, and no, they don't give you a hat. So you're, you're interpretive ranger, but they don't, they don't give you the hat. It's a really major event uh, for uh, the park. Uh, there's even a much smaller version held at the North Rim Lodge each year. Uh, I went there one year. Uh, they only, uh, only about a dozen scopes are set up there uh, on the South Rim. There's not a lot of room. They do it on the patio of the uh, North Rim Lodge. Uh, at the South Rim, at the early in the week when we didn't have as many people there, I walked around and counted 50 uh, telescopes. So we have more than 50 setups. Uh, there's usually one, you know, on average one plus uh, per setup because a lot of people bring family and friends to help. And um, we see about 10,000 people over the course of a week, um, you know, setting up, um, you know, doing, observing, look through the telescope, look through binoculars, explaining things. I don't know how many times I explained globular clusters and the structure of the Milky Way. Uh, to people that you are, you are essentially, like I said, you're an interpretive ranger uh, to a very large crowd of people uh, who come through. Uh, and it does get surprisingly cold. It's very hot during the day and it gets very cold at night. So you're going to, you're going to need to bring like all seasons uh, of clothes. Uh, there's lots of bling. The gift shops have, uh, they really are big on the whole night scar. Half, ha half the park is after dark uh, is a saying that, uh, that they come coined a few years back. Uh, the gift shops have more night sky shirts, books, stickers, mugs, everything you can possibly afford. Uh, if you do buy it all, uh, you'll have to ship some of the home because you won't be able to put it on the car. You can even buy telescopes. Uh, they, apparently they got to deal with Celestron. So that, I've seen a few Celestron scopes and, and there's a lot of gift shops. The so Grand Canyon is a really big place. Um, and there's, I probably went to at least five or six gift shops um, and that's probably only half or less than half of the gift shops spread around the, 
around the whole park. Uh, some of them are quite quite big. So here's uh, you know one photo from the lot. Uh, show, uh, early people are setting up. You can see a toboggan in the background. Uh, it's it's really funny because it's when you're setting up at five or six o'clock, it's really hot, uh, and then it'll drop down into the you know the 40s. We got down into the 30s uh, one of the nights uh, that I was there. And when you're sitting still and it's below 40 degrees, uh, you get you get pretty cold. Um, the Astronomy Club from Tucson is actually the primary sponsor of the event in terms of people power, uh, but there are volunteers from all over the place. Um, hilariously, a guy sat up next to me. He's like, hey, can I sit up here? And I'm he's like, is anybody sitting up here? And I'm like, well, you are apparently. It's fine. Um, yeah, where are you from? Kissimmee, Florida. And I'm like, no, he said that, not me. And I'm like, you're like right down the road from me. Uh, he's never heard of Cephas. He's only lived in Kissimmee for two years. He has heard of Cephas now. And um, Nick, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'm still looking for the card you gave me so I can send you uh, an email. Um, there are two bus parking lots reserved for the volunteers. Uh, one is really full and crowded, the primary bus parking lot. Uh, they have some live uh, view people with, with cameras. They're doing... Uh, live views in the sky uh, up at the entrance, people in wheelchairs or handicapped accessible uh, can, can roll up to those a lot easier than looking through, you know, everybody can't climb up on a ladder in the dark uh, to look through a, a giant daub. Uh, I was not set up in the main parking lot. I set up in the overflow lot. Uh, we had about 20 stations set up in the overflow lot, which is right next to it. And there's a there's red lighted paths to go to the overflow. Um, my friend, my regular friends there uh, set up uh, as well. Actually, I ended up there because a, a good friend of mine invited me and I've come back every year. Um, but we set up there too. That tends to be the lot of the actual, I, I, don't, I don't know how to say this nicely, but I just don't understand. Uh, it's the darkest sky I've ever seen anywhere, period. Um, the, the Milky Way is phenomenal. And 11 o'clock, everybody packs up and goes home and leaves. And um, I slept all day. It annoys my wife, uh, but I just slept. I sleep all day and I stay up all night if I can. That's what I'm there for. I'm there for the star party to, to make use of these dark skies. I've got a dark sky site down in Okeechobee and it's, it's nice and you can see the Milky Way, but it's not the Grand Canyon. Uh, we're at about 7,000 feet um, elevation. And um, like I said, the stars, the sky is just the mo most amazing uh, that, that you can, that, that I've seen anywhere. Um, I, we stay usually till the moon comes up or the clouds or the lightning, uh, which happens, uh, or it gets just too windy to, to do anything. Uh, so, you know, that, that's sort of the, the hardcore people, uh, they'll stay past that. There are talks and presentations every night, uh, mostly NASA or professional astronomers, uh, uh, one perennial one is on the history of the Apollo program. Apparently the Apollo astronauts did a lot of their geology training in Arizona and doing dry runs and things like that. I only went to one. It was a presentation from uh, one of the directors at the International Dark Sky Association. Uh, this photo was well before the presentation. Uh, this is after, this is more, um, you know, we had 700 to 750 people um, come to the presentation. So they were doing it in the indoor theater in the previous years. This year, not because of COVID, but because they're remodeling the theater, uh, they did them outside. And um, they're just blown away, 700 people. You can't fit 700 people in the, in the theaters at the visitor center. Uh, I think they're going to stick to outdoor uh, for future star parties because of this, uh, because so many more people could be uh, reached this way. But what happens is uh, the talk is at... at eight o'clock and at nine o'clock the talk's over and 700 people suddenly show up and want to look through your telescope. Uh, so it, it's an experience. Um, some people do leave their stuff out all day. Uh, the parking lot is like off limits. Technically they have signs up. You have to be an astronomer to come back here. Um, if you've ever worked with the public, you know, people don't pay any attention to those signs. Uh, and there's a lot of people passing through. This is very near uh, Nether Point. And a lot of people are just walking and cutting through the parking lots. So leave it up at your own risk. The park is fine with you leaving it there, but they're not, they're not going to be responsible. And so uh, some people, they just had larger setups uh, and they didn't want to, they didn't want to do it. There's lots of cool telescopes here. So this is really great um, because 
you know, if you're going to volunteer to do outreach for a week, you probably have a serious setup. Uh, there's a lot of homemade uh, scopes here. Uh, this is my friend Kevin. He's a guy who originally invited me uh, to. He said, "Hey, you need to come to the start to the Grand Canyon. It's awesome." Uh, he's got a brand new 28-inch uh, scope that he uses for outreach at his uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, where he lives. And let me tell you, a 20-inch scope under those dark skies, it was worth it was worth the drive. Um, lots of uh, you know big red here. Notice how warm the gentleman sitting in the chair is dressed. He's ready for a cold night. Uh, like I said, it is, oh, well, it's hot. It's a dry heat, um, drink lots, uh, and then it gets surprisingly cold at night. Um, one of my favorite homemade scopes, you've, you've, you've probably heard of telescopes referred to as uh, light buckets. He literally made his scope out of two buckets. Uh, the bottom bucket has the primary mirror and the second bucket has the focuser and the, and the secondary mirror. And I said, do you just, would you mind if I took your picture here? Uh, nice gentleman named Barry. Uh, but for there's, a, there's quite a few homemade scopes here, but that just, it just, I'm from Kentucky. I'm a Kentucky redneck hillbilly. And it's just like, it's it really, you might be a redneck if you built your telescope out of buckets. Snoopy, uh, he's been here every year. This little guy, I've not seen him before. Uh, this guy calls them uh, ginoculars. Uh, he took two refractors and made giant binoculars out of them. Um, I'd call it Wally and probably talk to it. I did not get a chance. I regret that I did not get a chance to come over and look through them after dark. Uh, but now I want to build one because I think that's just uh, one of the, that's probably my favorite setup uh, that, that I saw there. My setup a little bit more, a um, little bit more modest. Uh, this is my live viewing setup. Um, those who know me might be shocked I didn't bring one of my paramounts, but I thought I'd try one of these new little harmonic drive mounts. Um, in hindsight, I wish I'd brought my Mighty. Uh, the biggest challenge was cables. Uh, there's no place to run cables through here, and you can see it was a little crazy, uh, but it did the job, uh, and it is, was nice and small. Uh, that's my car. I drove to the Grand Canyon, um, and uh, I, I you. Some of you've heard the story where I, my car got broken into and somebody stole a, a great deal of all my favorite astronomy gear. And so now I try to travel much lighter and I bring everything into the hotel room. So I've got pelicans with wheels on them and everything. So a little small setup seemed a lot more appealing than bringing a Paramount. Um, the Paramount definitely would have performed better, but it was nice to have something that uh, you know was small. Uh, I, do my, uh, I do my live viewing. I've got a there's a little color camera on the back. I've got a goal zero power system and a small headless computer that I put an external monitor on and then I control it with my iPad. Um, and that's just a little 92 millimeter refractor. You don't need a giant telescope. Cameras are really, really sensitive. Um, so that worked really good. I mostly showed um, globular clusters and explained their dynamics and relation to the Milky Way, uh, which is gloriously overhead uh, during the star party. So it worked out. Uh, pretty nice. Speaking of the Milky Way gloriously overhead, here's a shot I took. I didn't send Derek any astrophotos because they're all in this presentation. Um, I shot this from the far end of the um, of the main scope lot. Uh, the south rim of the visitor center or the visitor center for the south rim is actually this building uh, right here. You can see the back of it. These red lights were very dim, uh, but this is um, this is eight second shot at ISO 1600. I have the same setup that the gentleman who shot um, uh, um, Old Faithful with, uh, Canon EOS RA on a tripod and the Sigma art lens. Uh, at, at, I shot, uh, it's an F1.4 lens. I shot it at, oh yeah, I shot it at F1.42, eight seconds, ISO 1600. It's the 20 millimeter uh, Sigma lens that it did for this. I also have a little device you could put on your camera and it'll automatically do time lapses and download them to your phone. So I did this time lapse. I cranked the ISO up to 6400 so I wouldn't have to stretch it in post. Uh, so the Milky Way is not as great as it could be. But this is uh, me. You'll see me back in my head a lot. That's my telescope. Get my mouse over here. That's my telescope there. Um, let's see. No curves or anything. I didn't do any real processing on the video. This is pretty much how it came. Uh, out of the camera, it, you can control it from your phone, which is which is pretty cool. I did another one. 
on a cloudy night. And I really like this, uh, the Milky Way uh, behind the clouds, you know, moving through there. I played hooky this night. I didn't set up. Uh, I did not want to fit. I did not want to chase um, sucker holes with the scope with the camera. Uh, this, this last image, actually, I'm just going to run it again. This is something you really got to take. You're here to do a service. You're not here to do astronomy. Uh, I had to remind myself of that a few times. There's a lot of lights. Uh, it is a dark sky site. Uh, the skies are amazing. And we tell people, bring your red flashlights. Um, but people leaving and their cars light up and they're, they're loading up their cars. Um, I, I had started this time last, I think, three or four or five times. And somebody was always starting their car. And I finally gave up and it's just like, let it run. And you can see here, you know, at the very end, somebody started their car and drove, you know, you know, leaving. And this is one of the one of the things that just from a personal standpoint surprises me the most. And, and I see this at, every, at a lot of star parties. I go to the Texas star party, glorious skies. And there's me and 10 other people who will watch the sun come up. Everybody else, 11 o'clock, it's bedtime and they go to bed. Maybe when I'm older, um, I will poop out. Uh, but, um, you know, my, my day may be coming, but, uh, if I'm going to drive across the country and haul a bunch of stuff and it's amazing sky, I'm going to get every last bit of amazing sky, um, you know, that I can get. And the Grand Canyon is no, is no different. Um, <clears throat> the club has a dark sky meter and I brought that along. I believe it was calibrated and, um, I got a reading at 21.88, um, without going into detail how this works, the maximum reading is 22. So it's pretty dark. This is a really nice, uh, really nice dark sky. Uh, and it was certified uh, by the uh, International Dark Sky Association as a dark sky park a few years ago. They still have a few renovations to do, but um, it's pretty much as dark as you can get without having a, a time machine. Uh, here's another shot of my friend Kevin's 28-inch uh, Dob with the Milky Way behind it. Uh, he had a night vision monocular and uh, borrowed one of my HA filters, which is a hydrogen filter, enhances the contrast and detail in Nebula. And um, the view is just spectacular, uh, just really, really, uh, really spectacular. I, again, I think Winter Star Party, I think, is my favorite star party um, in terms of the social aspect and the venue. Who doesn't want to spend a week in the Keys? But um, yeah, I, I when I was working for Software Bisc, I used to travel you know, at least every two months. I was at another star party for them. This is the, the darkest sky anywhere I've been um, ever. Well, I would say dark and in terms of darkness and transparency. Uh, the dry tortugas are pretty dark too, but there's a lot of moisture in the air because you're, you know, you're on an island. Um, the um, Haleakala in Hawaii was pretty close, uh, but not as much of the sky because uh, because the island because Maui, you know, lit things up. Uh, so I, I have to say this is might be my favorite star party in terms of sky uh, sky quality. I did try to do some other uh, wide field astrophotography while I was there. I brought along also this little Skywatcher mount. Um, I really couldn't do this during the event because like I said, you really are working. Um, and the moon came up early, so only got a little bit of time after, um, after the events or, or it got too windy where even this thing was getting like trying to get blown over uh, at some points. One of the clearest night, uh, Anyway, I, I did get a few images. Uh, this is um, a well-known area in Cygnus. You can see the North American nebula. Let me get my mouse pointer over here. Here's the North American and the Pelican. Um, and then this is uh, Gamma Cygnus down here, this little area. This is 30-second um, exposures, six of them stacked. I uh, shot them at ISO 1600, again, with the Canon EOS RA. Uh, this was with a 70 to 200 millimeter zoom. Um, you know, when I first got into astrophotography, the common wisdom was um, you wanted a prime lens. Uh, and prime doesn't mean the best. Prime mean, A prime lens means prime focus. It means it doesn't zoom. It has less glass in it. Uh, but this is the 21st century and uh, coatings technologies, you know, Canon and Nikon, they, you know, they, it's, ma it's, it's virtually magic. Uh, but you don't get reflections in a zoom lens like you, like you used to. Uh, I put a filter, a mask on mine. I stop it down to F4. I use a round circular mask 
so I don't get diffraction spikes off the stars. So it's essentially like a little short refractor uh, when you do that. If you just if you use the lens internal diaphragm, you get the blades, and you'll get you'll get spikes around the stars. So um, anyway, I shot this at 123 millimeters. So I had a 123 millimeter refractor shooting at f4, and um, three minutes of exposure, six uh, six exposures at 30 seconds. Uh, each. I also rented uh, a lens. You can, this is a great thing if you're into nightscapes, you can, you don't have to buy a lens, you can rent them. Um, lensrentals.com and borrowlenses.com are my, two of my favorite places to go. Uh, this is um, a Tamron 35 millimeter lens, uh, f1.4, surprisingly good. Uh, I, uh, I never would have thought Tamron does not strike me as like a high quality name, but I'm actually much happier with the stars in the corner with this in the corners with this lens than I was um, the Sigma lens. Uh, this is a single exposure, 20 seconds. It was tracked on the same uh, same rig I showed you a minute ago, just different setup, of course, because it's a different lens. I shot this at f2. I cropped it a little bit and I fixed the gradient because on the on one side of the Milky Way is pretty close to the ground and there was some a little bit of glow there. Um, and it was 20 seconds instead of 30 because it was dark and I was in a hurry and lightning was coming and I have fat fingers. Uh, otherwise it had been a 30 second exposure instead of, instead of 20. I thought I was shooting 30 seconds. Um, I kept this lens, by the way, another nice feature, uh, borrow, lens, not borrow, lensrentals.com. Um, if you don't want to send the lens back, you can just buy it, which I guess, you know, people don't send it back. You have to charge them for it anyway. So they just made it official and said, hey, you know, if you like this lens, you can just buy it. Uh, I really didn't get much of a discount over buying a brand new lens, but you know, the benefit is the lens in my hand works really good and I can just keep it. And so I kept this for, um, for future astrophotography projects. I really, really happy with, uh, with that Tamron lens. Um, Derek, if you're paying attention, if you already have one, you should definitely try one out. Um, no night. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, one of the nights was closed down. So it did, it does rain in Arizona. It's right at the beginning of monsoon season. Uh, my very first Grand Canyon star party, it was cloudy all week long. And my friend was like, this never happens. I'm so sorry. And I gave it another shot and came back and it was clear the whole week. And this time it was clear the whole week except for one night. Uh, so we were shut down. Next year, June 7th, uh, June 10th through 17th, I already have my reservation at one of the lodges in the park. And I plan to go back and um, maybe some of you will come along and we'll have a great time. And I see some things on chat. Anything I need to pay attention to? Hope you get a chance. <laughs> yeah, me too, John. Uh, I did talk to one of the rangers about that, the resident astronomer program. It's rather lengthy. So you have to commit to like three weeks or more. Um, which is a uh, which is tricky when you're when you're a working man. Um, okay, that's uh, Mauricio Omega Centauri. Yep, the Green Canyon star. Oh, okay, Bento. I remember Pen uh, John telling me he's he's been to it. Uh, and Derek is uh, yeah. You Derek's thrown this challenge down before. I'm like the Grand Canyon is the best anywhere, and he's like, yeah, you need to go to Grand ba uh, Great Basin. Um, it is beyond darker than the Grand Canyon. And you've been to the Grand Canyon, right, Derek? I guess you have. Um, oh, yeah. yes, I have, yes. Yeah, um, I need to. And um, the Great Basin, um, the spot that they have. First off, they have an observatory there. Mm -hmm. They're the only national park with a dedicated research level observatory. Uh, second off, the there's a parking lot at over 10,500 feet. And uh, you can actually see sky glow with the naked eye. Or not, yeah, sky glow with the naked eye. Wow. Air glow, excuse me, air glow. Mm hmm air glow of the naked eye um incredibly oh. dark and um and uh definitely and plus it's just absolutely beautiful park and less visited so you definitely won't see as many tour buses and stuff up there so yeah cool cool yeah i think next year when i go back i'm going to play hooky a couple of nights um i i, I did go and scout out um I hate to give away my scouting knowledge, but it might be useful to somebody else. There's a place called uh, the Watchtower uh, or the Desert View. And um, you can go there. Like I said, the park is accessible 24 hours a day. And so I scouted out that with my compass. And you can, there's some places you can set up that are 
not risky, you know, to set up in the dark because you don't want to go, you know, over at the edge, uh, too much to the edge when there's because the Grand Canyon, it's a it's a dangerous place. There's a book this thick you can buy in the gift shop called Death in the Canyon. And uh, they chronicle all the people who have died in the canyon. Um, the last two weeks before we went, I saw at least two things pop up because <clears throat> my brain is keyed to Grand Canyon things. You know, Arizona woman, Canada woman, somebody falls to their death, somebody hiked, you know, <clears throat> to the bottom and then didn't have the energy to get out instead of dying. So you have to take the place seriously. Um, on the South Rim, <clears throat> if you go to Mather Point in the dark, it's pretty safe. They've got guardrails and things there. If you go to some of the other watch points, there's there's nothing to keep you from falling off the edge and dying other than common sense. And if you go there in the dark, um, it's very easy to miss misstep. Uh, but there's some safe places around the desert view. Um, I've been wanting to do some star trails because there's a big tower there. And um, yeah, I'm just going to have to play hooky uh, to, to go. It's usually the 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 star parties in June, they, they don't want it to be too close to the 4th of July because the park is just bonkers for the 4th of July. Um, so it, it's anyway, for reasons, <clears throat> it's got to be in June. A lot of times the moon rises pretty early. Next year, the moon is going to rise a lot later than it did this year. Um, <clears throat> so because otherwise I would have went after the star party was over, I thought about driving over to the desert view, but the moon was coming up too soon. You can't do a star trails more in an hour without the moon coming up. So anyhow, I could talk about it all night and it's 930 and we still have 12 people who have not given up. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So the, 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 well, we had 25 people at the beginning of the program. We have 12 now lesson learned. Don't go over two hours. So, um, Thank you, everybody, for coming. I don't think there's anything urgent we need to talk about tonight. Uh, next month, there is no uh, official meeting. September, we will have our kickoff star party at the campus. It'll be on a Saturday. We will announce details and a date and everything about that um, in, the, uh, in the near future. Keep your eyes on Groups.io and the Facebook page for announcements about that. Um, until then, take care, everybody, and uh, see you soon. Keep looking up. Bye.